we'll wait for one minute and then we'll start. Yeah, we can start. Uh, welcome, friends. Uh, welcome to the 65th meeting of Borivali Central CP Study Circle during the year 2021-22. And a very much awaited event of the year. Normally, a chartered accountant always wait for the union budget every year. So now on 1st April, February, we had this budget. And as usual, we esteemed speaker, Badres Doshi, sir, is with us today. Last year also, he has shared a lots of updates and today he is with us again. So we are thankful to him, sir, uh, for uh, giving your inputs to Borioli Center CP Study Circle. I would now request uh, to uh, Sikandar to please uh, present the ICI motto, please, first. Uh, I, I'll require a hosting rights for that. Uh. Uh, Badr, sir, uh, just put a co-host, make a co-host to Sikandar in your settings. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I would request everyone to please rise for the ICI motto, please. members now i request sharad bhai said to please take charge of the session please thank you nilesh for a present task of introduction of uh, today's speaker ca badres doshi ca badres doshi is a commerce graduate as well as chartered accountant and he has obtained uh, ranks throughout all c examinations he achieved 23rd 20 33rd and 11th rank respectively in CA Foundation, Intermediate CA as well as Final CA. He has also done advanced diploma in international taxation and has cleared paper on the principle of international taxation as a part of ADIT course conducted by ICI, uh, sorry, conducted by Chartered Institute of Taxation, UK. Badrasbhai is a practicing since last 19 years. 
his four area of practice is a litigation matter up to ITAT level and consultation on income tax matters, including international taxation. He is also a member of the Managing Council of Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, as well as General Committee and Taxation Committee of Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. He is a member of General Committee of Chamber of Tax Consultant. He is a co-author of controversy articles which is published every month, controversial articles, which is published every month in BCA journal. He has authored a book on income tax declaration scheme 2016 for BCS. He has been a paper writer for BCS RRC. Even he was a paper writer for our BCSC RRC also. He is author, budget publication and referencer of BCS. With this brief introduction, if I keep on uh, I'll be uh, thankful to Badresh Bhai for addressing us on the second consecutive year on budget. Welcome, by Badresh Bhai. Now, floor is yours. Before, but before that, I'll request convener C. N. S. Vasa to present a virtual memento. Kindly accept. Badresh sir, please accept the e memento on behalf of Borivali Central City Study Circle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Otherwise, by now, speech is yours. Yeah. So, so I need to share the screen. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just uh, start the presentation. Yeah. Please. Uh, yeah. So, convener uh, Nilesh by and other organizers, Sharad Bhai, Pradeep Ji, Bijal, and all the participants and members of uh, Borivali Study Circle. Good evening to all of you friends. And uh, at the outset, before I begin, I am thankful to all of you for uh, calling me uh, for the second time for presenting my analysis on Finance Bill 2022. Uh, When I went through the uh, direct text proposal of uh, Finance Bill 2022, friends, uh, what personally I realized that there were a lot of amendments, but the number of amendments in the Income Tax Act, which gives a favor to the taxpayers at large, are very few and probably not more than a couple of them. I am talking about the amendments which might result into some kind of favor to the taxpayers at large. I am not talking about a group of taxpayers. Okay, uh, there is an amendment, for example, a reduction in the rate of surcharge, which we are going to discuss. You know? That is a favorable amendment, but that will be not resulting into benefits to majority of the taxpayers at large. So when we are referring to benefits, to the taxpayers at large, there are hardly any amendments uh, in the Income Tax Act for this year. The reason could be that uh, in the past years, a lot of things were already done. So for example, there was a, a substantial reduction in the rate of tax for the corporate SSEs as well as to non-corporate SSEs, giving an optional tax regime to an individual or HUF under 615 BAC. So a lot many things uh, which were required were probably done and therefore uh, they were exhausted probably. And that was might be the reason that uh, no such further uh, benefits were given to the taxpayers at large through this finance bill 2022. But what I believe personally is that even if uh, the rates could not have been reduced, but there were a lot of other things which could have been done. Uh, through this Finance Bill 2022 on the front of this direct tax. So, for example, uh, you know, there is a proposal to say that if there is a cess which is paid under this Income Tax Act, that amount of cess which has been paid cannot be claimed as a deduction and that will be disallowed. A good amendment, but probably there was a need to revisit this concept of cess under the Income Tax Act, probably is because since 2005, uh, this cess was levied initially. 
but when it was levied it was only for a temporary period of time not more than for one year or two years might be but thereafter this has continued it not only continued but the rate of cess as we all know has been increased over a period of time so was there a need for a levy kind a levy of such a cess which was introduced originally for a very very limited period of time to continue with this that is a question which was uh, uh, which is in fact always ar arising in my mind when i uh, you know try to understand this finance bill lot of things which could have been done for, for example uh, you know deduction could have been granted on a medical expenditure which is incurred by the taxpayer there is a proposal for giving some tax benefit but that would work only in a case where that person has received some amount as a reimbursement for medical expenditure or a compensation on death of some family member due to covid etc but what if for a middle class persons like us where a person is incurring some medical expenses on his own without receiving any reimbursement from anyone there could be you no know, deduction which could have been granted under the provisions like atd subject to some upper limits you know, that might have helped a uh, uh, number of taxpayers at large many thing could have been done uh, you know to simplify this presumptive schemes of taxes and under 44 uh, ad etc we all know that uh, in majority of the cases instead of resulting into some benefits to the small taxpayers in majority of these cases it basically it results into some kind of a hardship uh, when we apply this presumptive schemes of taxes and the list is very big you know number of things could have been done i'll not just keep on you know mentioning about this list because that is not the uh, subject of our discussion so it was just an opening remark that all of those things if probably some benefits could have been extended through this finance bill to the taxpayers at large it would have helped a lot to all of this taxpayers when we see uh, the numbers it becomes very important for this year is because if you look at the last figure in my slide that is the proposed figures of direct tax collection for the coming year 22 23 and if you can see this figure it is 14 lakh 20000 crores and it gives an indication that now we are hoping all the things to get normalized after this covid impact uh, in the financial year to come because uh, if you see the first figure for the financial year 2021 originally the target for direct tax collection was set at 13 lakh 19000 crore and then it had to be revised because of this covid etc the second year also we could not set the higher target but now i think there is a time to you know revisit this target and probably a right thing has been done a target is being set for footing like 20000 crore of direct tax collection including corporate taxes and individual taxes and for the coming financial year now before i come to the analysis of the proposals uh, dealing with changes in the income tax act let me just clarify few points friends is that what i have done is that i have divided all the proposals into 12 different categories 12 different groups okay uh, out of this 12 different groups probably i hope that i'll be able to discuss at least 10 or 11 out of them if for want of time if the you know last couple of them which i have not be able to do there are some miscellaneous kind of amendments and therefore uh, i'll be you know sharing this presentation so all the important points are available in this presentation whatever this 12 groups of amendments which i have covered in my presentation is not dealing exhaustively with all the amendments uh, which have been made in the income tax act through this finance bill 2022 so for example the you know there are amendments uh, dealing extensively with the taxation of charitable trust and religious trust which i am not covering in my presentation because the objective is to you know present this analysis in a very short period of time of around 2 to 2 to and a half hours and therefore i will be more concentrating on those amendments which would be benefiting all the participants at large instead of just referring to a very very specific amendment which might not help all of us in our day to day practice and therefore i will be concentrating more on the uh, amendments which are be which will be becoming applicable in our day to day practice while dealing with our clients so let me begin with this and the first amendment is on rate of tax a very simple amendment otherwise there is no change in any of these rates of tax which are applicable to any type of the taxpayer except for an association of person where there is a change in the surcharge where aop is consisting of all members which are uh, corporate sse since that would not be a very common situation i am not going to deal with that particular uh, change in the rate of surcharge but the important change in the rate of surcharge is 
in case of an individual hqf etc where we know that the highest rate of surcharge which is applicable to them is 37 percentage but even at present this highest rate of surcharge of 37 percentage is not applicable to certain specific types of income to this certain specific types of the income the rate of surcharge is kept only at 15 percentage and therefore there is a provision to that effect that the surcharge can never be computed at a rate which is higher than 15 percentage maximum at 15 percentage depending upon what is the uh, total amount of income of that particular sse on this uh, types of income and they are at present only dividend income which is now becoming taxable a short term capital gain under 111a and long term capital gain under section 112a so basically a capital gain which is arising from an stt paid transaction that is the income on which this benefit of capping of surcharge at 15 percentage is applicable now there is a change and what is that change is one more item of income is added in this list and that item of income is now any long term capital gain which is arising and becoming taxable under section 112 what is the implication of this change is very very simple it says that now that long term capital gain need not be only from stt paid transaction that long term capital gain gain can be from transfer of any type of a long term capital asset be it unlisted shares or immovable property or anything else if there is a long term capital gain whenever the tax is computed on this long term capital gain the rate of surcharge can never be more than 15 percentage so the rate of surcharge which is above 15 percentage that is 25 percentage and 37 percentage rate of surcharge will never apply while computing a tax liability of a long term capital gain so that is a favorable amendment but since Uh, we know that this uh, surcharge is not applicable for an SSE having income below fifty lakhs. The tax uh, yes. the taxpayers at large, I don't think that they would be benefited uh, yes. because of this amendment. But in any cases, wherever there is a long term capital gain and otherwise surcharge is applicable, certainly this is going to result into some kind of tax benefits to them. Now let me move on to the second uh, uh, set of amendments which deals with filing of an updated ITR. you must have heard about this particular proposal but now i think it is a time to understand this proposal at length in detail what i'm going to do is that i'm going to spend uh, around more than 20 25 minutes uh, to discuss and to analyze this particular amendment on filing of an updated itr because there are a lot of issues and difficulties which are going to arise when we actually apply this provision in practice and therefore we need to understand this amendment in more detail what is the background of this particular amendment we can understand this background from the memorandum which explains the provisions of finance bill and it has been mentioned in the memorandum that look whatever is the current window which is available for filing of an itr on the income tax portal that window gets closed in a very very limited period of time so the maximum time period which is available leaving aside the extension which is now available due to this covid etc but otherwise in a normal scenario if there is no extension the maximum time period which is available for any ssa to file his income tax return is 9 months the regular return is within due date which is a july or a october and then if there is an error the return can be revised or if the return was not filed at all a belated return can be filed but irrespective of what is the type of the return which you are filing be it regular return or a revised return or a belated return the maximum time period is 31st of december of that particular assessment year after 31st of december of that assessment year no return can be filed even return file cannot be revised or if the return which is already a return if not filed belated return cannot be filed now because of this what happens that we know that the income tax department is using this data mining techniques and therefore many of the financial transactions having high value are reported by different agencies or sources to the income tax department and after this information is gathered by the income tax department there is a matching process which is taking place so this information of finance high value financial transaction is being compared with the itr which have been filed by the ssc so in a case where the itr is missing in the system though there is a high value financial transaction which is executed or the itr is filed but the corresponding income is not appearing in the income tax return there is it results into a mismatch and moment there is a mismatch the income tax department has to initiate some kind of proceedings uh, in those cases of the taxpayers and therefore with this particular uh, strategy of data mining and matching technology the amendment is proposed 
as a as a result of which the idea is to give more time for self compliance by the taxpayer in a case where you already filed the itr or itr has not been filed and if there is such a mismatch which is resulting you have been given one more opportunity of two years that you can come forward and make a self compliance a voluntary voluntary compliance and offer that particular amount of income pay the tax liability and this is going to result into a litigation free environment because you yourself is admitting this and offering this particular income and tax liability in this itr with this particular objective this set of amendments have been proposed in the income tax act before i deal with this particular uh, amendments uh, in section 139 and several other section one point which i want to highlight over here is that if you read the memorandum friends openly in the memorandum it has been admitted that this additional timeline the additional timeline for filing a revised or a belated return which is up to 31st of december is not adequate and that is the reason why a change has been proposed that now we are bringing a an option of filing a new kind of return which is an updated return now the question over here friends is that if you yourself is admitting that this additional timeline for filing a belated return or a revised return is not adequate first of all that timeline should be made adequate okay uh, in last year itself in the finance bill 2021 they had only proposed that this timeline for filing of a revised return or a belated return should be curtailed by 3 months originally friends if you recollect the time limit available for filing of such kind of return was 1 year from the end of the relevant assessment year thereafter that additional 1 year was removed and it was made only till the end of the assessment year and last year even within this assessment year 3 months have been reduced and it was made only this 9 uh, months from of that particular assessment year which is 31st of december so af year after year the time limit which was available for filing of a revised or a belated return has been shortened and now it has been admitted this timeline available for filing of a belated return or a revised return is not adequate and therefore we are bringing an option of filing a new return which is an updated return is not fair according to me first of all the time limit should have been provided a reasonable time limit should have been provided for filing of a belated return or a revised return in case of an audit by 31st of october you file your return and only two months are available to find out whether there are any errors or omission and to file and a revised return to rectify those errors so which is not uh, sufficient enough which they they have also admitted now with this let us try to focus on the amendments and what are the consequences of amendments and what are the issues which are going to arise uh, in any case where a person intends to file the updated return so a new subsection 8a has been inserted in section 139 itself which deals with filing of a regular return and it enables any person to file an updated return provided there are two conditions important conditions which one will have to bear in mind that this option of filing the updated return is only for the benefit of the government i have already made an opening remark that there are hardly any amendments which are for the benefit of the taxpayers so when you are filing an updated return one will have to ensure that you are offering an additional tax liability in that updated return otherwise this window for filing of an updated return is not available for you and second very important condition is that you are allowed to file this updated return provided some additional amount of income tax is being paid with filing of this updated return i am going to deal with this payment of additional income tax at length in the subsequent slide but just keep these two points in your mind and this is a concept or a basics of filing of an updated return and with this we need to understand this provisions in detail so who can file the updated return is practically every each and every every ss is allowed to file this updated return as long as you are satisfying these two conditions because the government doesn't have a problem it is resulting into some additional revenue for the government it is irrespective of whether you had already filed your itr earlier under the regular provisions or revised returns or belated return or you are a non filer even non filers are a welcome for filing of an updated return within this particular provision there is a negative list which is provided otherwise every ss is allowed to file the updated return but it is subject to a negative list if your case falls under that negative list because of some or the other reason only in that case you will be prohibited from filing of an updated return otherwise you can file the updated return uh, in every cases so what is that negative list the negative list number 1 is that if you have already filed your updated return earlier 
for the same assessment year. In that case, now you cannot file the updated return once again. This restriction on filing of updated return is required to be seen qua assessment year. It is not something like a once in a lifetime opportunity that once I have filed an updated return for any year, for every other year, I'll not be allowed to do so. It is not like that. We have to see this restriction with respect to the same assessment year. So once I have exhausted this particular option of filing an updated return, Second time, now I cannot come forward for filing of an updated return for further increasing my tax liability. That is something which is not permissible. If you are a person who, who falls under a notified cases of persons or class of person, in that case also, you will not be permitted to file the updated return. So probably the idea is that the central government will come out with some kind of a notification prohibiting filing of an updated return in certain cases. So for example, it could be some kind of, you know, uh, politicians, if you are members of parliament, etc., probably uh, the option should not be allowed to them for filing of an updated return because they will have to always come clean while filing of the original return. That is how I understand this. Uh, the other restrictions are applicable on the basis of what is the end result of the updated return you are filing. So the end result of your updated return is any of these three then you are not permitted to file the updated return. This restriction is basically with the same objective is that if you're filing an updated return, it should always be for the benefit of the income tax department, not for your benefit. So what are those cases? Number one, if that updated return is a loss return. So you are declaring loss in your updated return. Moment there is a loss coming in updated return, you will not be permitted to file the updated return at all. If that updated return is reducing your total tax liability, which was already determined on the basis of your earlier return. So earlier you had already filed your ITR and now you want to file your updated return. And in updated return, you are reducing your total tax liability. It is resulting into benefit to the taxpayer, something which is not permissible. Updated return cannot be filed. Or you had claimed some refund in the earlier ITR and now you are filing an updated return, increasing your claim of refund. Once again, in that case also, you will not be permitted to file the updated return. Or in case of a refund, if you are filing this updated return for the first time, you had never filed your ITR earlier, and you are claiming this refund in the updated return, which you are now filing for the first time, once again, that opportunity is being lost. You should have filed your ITR claiming the uh, uh, refund in the regular course under section 139. Updated ITR is not an option which is available to you. So in these three cases also, you are not permitted to file the updated return. Further, filing of an updated return won't be permitted because of some actions which have already been initiated or completed by the income tax department. So here in your case, in your matter, income tax department is already seized of your matter. And that is the reason why you are not permitted to file the updated return. So what are those cases? Basically, in any case where proceeding for assessment or reassessment or recomputation or revision, any of these proceedings basically deals with a regular assessment, reassessment and revision under section 263, et cetera. If that is pending or it has already been completed, in both these cases, you are not permitted to file the updated return. So that means if 143.2 notice has already been issued to you, a regular assessment is going on, you cannot now come forward and file your updated return already uh, admitting income, which is already a subject matter of assessment. That is the objective of not uh, providing this option of filing of an updated return in that particular case is fair. And the second one is in any case where any proceeding has been initiated for that year, in that case, once again, the updated return cannot be filed for the year for which the prosecution proceeding has already been initiated. Prosecution proceeding under the income tax, under chapter 22, under any provision dealing with this prosecution. And there's one more, which says that if the assessing officer has already received some information in your case for that year, and further that information has already been communicated to that concerned SSE, in that case also, no updated return can, can, uh, can be filed because even in that case, the department is already seized documenter. And what is that information? That information could be an information under double tax avoidance agreement. So related to some cross-border transactions or alternatively, it can be an information under some other applicable law, which I have already listed in my slide. So some of them is Benami Properties Act or uh, PMLA, for example, 
or a black money act so under the respective acts dealing with this financial transaction if the some information has already been received by the assessing officer for the purpose of income tax act in that case if their information has been communicated you will not be allowed to file the updated return under this new provision so these are three restrictions which are applicable because of some action has already been initiated uh, in your case for that very year uh, by the income tax department the next restriction and the last restriction which is applicable in cases of search 132 requisition under section 132a or a survey under section 133a and when i am referring to a survey friends please note that i am not referring to a tds or a tcs survey which is for totally with, with a different objective and not with the objective of an assessment of income and therefore that cannot come in way for me to file an updated return so in any of these cases of search or survey etc the updated return cannot be filed the updated return cannot be filed for the year in which that search or survey is conducted and plus two preceding assessment years so the updated return window is blocked for basically for 3 years and there is a timeline for filing of an updated return which is basically 24 months from the end of the assessment year so what has been done over here is that moment there is a search or a survey the window available for filing of an updated return for all the years it would be available only for 3 years so for all the years wherever it was otherwise possible for that assessee to come forward and file the updated return including probably the income which is subject matter of search or survey that window is blocked none of the years you can file the updated return because now the department has conducted a search and now department is going to proceed for the purpose of assessment in your case so all the consequences of the assessment should follow and you should not be permitted to file the updated return in this particular case and friends this restrictions which is uh, for filing of an updated return in the case of search etc is not only applicable to the person in whose case the search is conducted but also to some other person whose some assets or books of accounts or documents have been found in this search just to make it very simple uh, so for example if there is a search in my case i hope that it doesn't take place but just assuming that if there is a search in my place so i'll be prohibited from filing this updated return for 3 years as well as during the course of search in my case is some undisclosed assets or some books etc are found which are belonging to you or some books or documents are found and the information therein is therein is pertaining to you in that case you will also not be allowed to file this updated return for this are uh, 3 years so this restriction is not only for the person in whose case the search is connected search is conducted but also applicable to the other connected person where that condition is satisfied what is the timeline available for filing of an updated return as i already mentioned to you is 24 months basically 2 years are available so 2 years from the end of the assessment year this updated return can be filed and this new provision enabling filing of an updated return under 13988a is effective from 14 friends i am categorically referring to 1st of april 2022 i am not referring to assessment year 2020 to 23 and therefore the applicability needs to be seen as 1st of april 22 i am going to deal with that uh, issue which is which might arise as far as this applicable date is concerned what are the important points or some important issues which might arise which we need to understand before we apply this concept or or this uh, filing of an updated return in practice there can be two different circumstances one is a case where the taxpayer had not filed his itr at all a non filer's case and the second one is a case where i have already filed my itr and now i am thinking of filing an updated return under this new provision in the first case you are permitted to file the updated itr which becomes your first itr for that year you were otherwise a non filer subject to the condition that the updated return which you are now filing for the first time should neither be a loss return or it also should not be a return claiming a refund subject to this you are permitted to file your updated return of course those other restrictions will apply where your assessment is pending or some information is received etc but subject to that otherwise normally filing of an updated return is possible in a case where i'm sorry so in other case where itr was already filed by me earlier and now i want to file an updated itr 
in that case i am permitted to file the updated itr which consists of only upward revision i need to increase my tax liability i need to offer an additional income which was not already offered earlier downward revision is not something which is permissible in the updated return which now i am filing under this new provision whether i am supposed to see the net effect as far as this upward revision is concerned what do i mean by this so for example i had already filed my itr earlier there was one particular transaction which was executed by me in this year and the corresponding income from that transaction is being already offered in my itr which was already filed by me but there was some error which i found and by mistake i had offered higher amount of income from that particular transaction in the itr which had been filed by me and therefore i now i want to revise this revise this amount of income uh, at an amount which is lesser than the amount of income which i had already offered so there is a downward revision so for example 10 lakhs income was already offered with respect to that transaction and now i thought that no no it should have been only 8 lakhs and not 10 lakhs so i want to reduce my income by 2 lakhs and i found that there is some other transactions which are being missed out so i want to offer an additional income from the other transactions and that amount of income is 3 lakhs so there is a reduction of 2 lakhs otherwise and i'm offering some additional income of 3 lakhs and the net impact of this is increased by 1 lakh can i do so or i have to just offer income only for new from new transactions i don't think that there could be an issue as far as netting off is concerned as long as your net result what we have to see is the net result as long as your net result of filing of an updated return is resulting into an increase in your tax liability you should be permitted to file the updated return what in a case what if there is a loss so itr was already filed declaring an x amount of loss and now i want to file an updated return reducing that amount of loss which i had already declared so otherwise it is resulting into some benefits for the government because i am reducing my loss claim it might have some consequences in the subsequent year in which i might have claimed a set off of that brought forward amount of loss so i want to reduce my amount of loss can i file an updated return the answer technically speaking is no because if you go back to the negative list the one of the item which is referred there is that if the updated return is a loss return it doesn't say that if original return which was filed was a loss return and now you are filing updated return reducing the amount of loss you are permitted to do that that is not something which is expressly provided and therefore probably as per technical reading of this provision it appears to me that if the updated return is a loss return irrespective of it is a first return claiming a loss or a second return reducing the amount of loss already claimed updated return filing is something which is not permitted and there is a reason to this is because additional tax liability should be payable on filing of the updated return and there is no computation mechanism which is provided for computing an additional amount of tax uh, while filing of an updated return which is a loss return uh it says that if the assessment is pending or is completed you are not permitted to file the updated return and when i refer to that particular point i categorically refer to a word recomputation the word recomputation is already used there and therefore the question which arises over here is that whether processing of itr under section 130 1431 can that be considered as a recomputation of income on the basis of my itr by the income tax department and therefore i am not permitted to file the updated itr the answer to my mind is no uh, the word recomputation is used in the context of the provisions of section 147 if you read section 147 it also uses the terminology of assessment reassessment or recomputation and therefore it is in that context that word recomputation is used and not in this context it, and, and, and other reason is that if the filing of updated itr is not allowed in every cases where my itr is already processed under 1431 then probably no one would be al uh, allowed to file the updated return where i have already filed my itr because all itrs now filed are invariably processed by cpc and therefore that should not be considered uh, as a you know something which which is in the form of a restriction which is applicable to me for the purpose of filing my updated itr if a prosecution proceeding is initiated under any provisions of the act i am debarred from filing of an updated return so for instance the prosecution is initiated for default in tds or tcs transactions or uh, provisions even in that case i am not permitted to file my updated return so basically that prosecution has nothing to do with assessment of my income but 
this is how the provision is probably there is a need to make a representation on this point that it should be only a prosecution dealing with uh, offense of filing of a return or offense of evasion of a tax liability by that person that should all only be considered and not any other prosecution under any other provisions of the act friends if there is a time which is available for filing of an uh, belated return or a revised return that should always be preferred so all other options should be exhausted it's very obvious and logical and only after all other options are exhausted one can think of come to this option of filing of an updated return and the reason is very simple is because here when you file an updated return there will be an additional amount which be, which will be becoming payable which i'm going to discuss in the subsequent slide and the last issue over here is that whether i can file the updated return for ay 2021 after 1st of april 22 so when i was referring to that applicable date it is 1st of april 22 and not merely assessment year 22 23 and therefore to my mind the answer to this question is yes moment this provision is coming into effect and provided the portal should also be supporting to us which is nowadays is a great difficulty so provided that option is available on the portal as long as the 24 months from the end of assessment year has not expired the person should be allowed to file the updated itr even for the past assessment years the other point is that is it possible for me to file an updated return declaring the same amount of income and the same amount of a tax liability which i had already declared in my earlier regular itr can i do this before i answer that this particular question the other obvious questions which would be arising in the minds of the participants that then what is the need of filing of an updated return why one would think of filing of an updated return in that case there can be some logical reasons behind this in the itr there are number of disclosures which are applicable take an example of disclosure related to foreign assets and nowadays if there is a default even in the disclosures there are some consequences which are going to follow in penalty and several other consequences so consider a case where i have missed out certain disclosures which are applicable to me or i have included some wrong information in that disclosure which was to be made can i now file an updated return just making this disclosure correct without disturbing my amount of income or an amount of tax liability the other logical case case could be that my itr is being processed by cpc and the information which was being reported in my itr was a uh, wrong and due to which it is resulting into some demand from cpc and all other options are not working i am not allowed to now file my revised return the time limit has already gone 154 is also not working because cpc is not accepting your uh, request to rectify this under 154 there could be a classic case you know very common case where cooperative societies are eligible for a deduction under section 80p but subject to the condition is that itr is filed within the due date Now, i have seen many of the cases where such societies have filed their itr but they have missed out in reporting in the itr that whether some other audit is applicable to you under some other act now they are always subject to an audit under the cooperative societies act and therefore they should have reported this but since they have missed out in many of the cases cpc was taking 31st of july as a due date applicable in non audit case and to all such itrs by societies which were filed after 31st of july atp deduction was not granted now in that case rectification was not working because you were changing some important particulars of the itr and therefore in such case that society might think of filing of an updated itr correcting those particular information contained in the itr so in all these cases the question is whether that person should be allowed to file the updated itr or not the answer to that question as it appears from the literal reading of this provision is yes is because it is not a condition that it should be resulting into some increase in the tax liability though while explaining the concept i mentioned to you that this is the idea but friends as per the provision that is not a precondition the provision is other way around that if it is resulting into a decrease in tax liability you are not allowed to file the updated return the provision is not in a manner that it is only if it is resulting into increase in tax liability then only you will be permitted to file the updated return the provision is in not in that manner and therefore probably filing of an updated return should be allowed in that particular case but whatever i am explaining over here is as per the law friends nowadays we are living in an era where cpc is a king okay law is not a king okay so cpc is going to decide how the law will be given effect to and therefore it will all depend on cpc whether the cpc is accepting your updated return in all those cases which which i was just explaining to you 
now we have we'll just move on to some other provision dealing with these updated returns so we have a new section 140b which is inserted in this income tax act which is a corresponding or a supporting provision when while filing of an updated itr that filer will have to pay the amount of tax interest fees and additional income tax now how all these amounts are required to be calculated today we have section 140a which provides for the amount of self assessment tax to be paid at the time of filing of a return and now we have a corresponding provision for updated return which is section 140b so first i'll deal with the amount of additional income tax because i know that you must be waiting for you know analysis of this additional amount of income tax because any decision of filing of an updated return would always depend on what is the additional outgo in the form of uh, uh, additional income tax yes sarath bhai uh, i think i am uh, sometime your loss is getting lost is it because of me or other yeah so if someone else can confirm no your sound is clear sir maybe uh, some issue at your end but the voice here is clear sir no no sound is clear but sometimes it is missing no no there is no issue here sir okay sorry okay. sorry for that okay no problem whatever disturbance please let me know because otherwise i'll be in my phone and i'll never realize yeah that's good no no sir it's clear if there would have been something i think i would have yeah, we please. would have told you sir please 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 okay so now what is the additional income tax which we, which will become payable uh, in any case where the person is filing an updated return it's very simple you also must have heard about this that it will be depending on the period within which you are filing your updated return you are permitted two years okay so if the updated itr is filed within the first year okay i have given an example you can look at the middle column in my table in the slide so if you are taking assessment year 22 23 is as the example in that case till 31st of december 22 i have an option of filing that belated or a revised return so till 31st of december no one would think of filing of this updated return so effectively that period will start from 1st of january 22 the provision only tells us what is the end date provision doesn't tell us that what is the start date if you want to file updated return even prior to 1st of january 22 you are most welcome because in that case government is benefited you are going to pay additional amount of income tax okay so logically the period will commence from 1st of january 22 and therefore if updated itr is filed from 1st january 22 up to 31st of march 24 which is within one year from the end of the assessment year the additional income tax payable is 20 25 percentage but if the updated itr is filed in the second year thereafter which is financial year 24 25 in that case your additional income tax liability will be 50 percentage double the amount of additional income tax which was otherwise payable in the first year and friends this percentage that is 25 percentage or 50 percentage depending upon the year in which you are filing this updated itr would be a percentage of aggregate amount of tax as well as interest payable while filing the updated return i'll repeat this additional income tax is payable at this percentage not only on tax amount which is payable but it is on a sum total of tax and interest which is payable by at the time of filing of this updated return and when i say is tax you have to include all types of surcharge and cess for that matter there should not be any dispute there is a categorical provision to this effect so friends before we proceed further the question which is going to arise over here is that when we are talking about uh, you know penal consequences this is in the form of some kind of a penal consequences because you had missed out some income earlier or you were a non filer and now you are you are given this option to file the updated return therefore you have to pay this 25 percentage or 50 percentage of tax and interest liability so when we are referring to this a question which is arising over here friends in my mind is that whether this would be becoming a non starter provision the reason i will be just explaining you very quickly consider a case that some income was not offered in the itr which was already filed by me and now i have a two, i have two options option number 1 is to file the updated itr in accordance with this new provision which we are just discussing and pay this additional income tax uh, along with my updated itr or i have a second option that i do not file the updated return and i just wait for the assessment to happen and the assessment is concluding 
concluded adding that particular amount of income which was not included in my ITR. Though friends, when I am explaining these two provisions, I am not advocating or I am not subscribing to a view that the person should not make a self-compliance or a voluntary compliance. It is just for the matter of discussion. We are just trying to analyze both this position so that we can better understand whether the quantum of liability which becomes payable up in, while filing the updated ITR which is proposed, whether that is reasonable or that is unreasonable. That is the idea of this discussion. So in these two options which are available, Further consider a case that it is a case where it is only resulting into an under-reporting of an income. The penal consequences under section 270A would depend upon whether there is an under-reporting of an income or a misreporting of an income. So let's not just consider a case of misreporting of an income because there the consequences would be higher, 200 percentage of tax as penalty. But if there is just merely an under-reporting of an income, in that case, if my assessment happens and if the income is included, what are the consequences of this? I have to pay the tax liability on this along with the interest. The tax and interest is payable even at the time of filing of an updated ITR also. There's no difference in between these two options as far as the tax and interest is concerned. But since now there, it will be resulting into an under-reporting of an income, I'll be penalized under section, section 270A and the penalty which becomes payable under section 270A is 50 percentage of only tax liability which is payable due to under-reporting of income. There the tax liability is quantified not on the basis of tax plus interest. But here if you look at in the second year, my additional outgo is 50 percentage of the tax plus interest. So here obviously my outgo on account of additional income tax would be more as compared to a case, an option where I'm already assessed and only penalties levied under section 270A. So that is how one can compare both these provisions. And further to tell you, so here effectively what is happening is my interest rate is becoming 1.5 percentage for, the, for, for practical purposes of all interest liability under 234ABC. Whereas if there I am under penalized under section 270A, my interest is not disturbed. It is only a 50 percentage of the tax liability which I have to pay. And further, one step further, uh, in that particular case where there is only an under-reporting of an income, what you can do probably is as soon as the demand is raised, if the total demand including tax and interest is paid, you have another option of availing an immunity from the assessing officer under section 270AA. And that immunity is granted, the even penalty of that 50 percentage on under-reported income is also not payable under section 270A. Whereas here we don't have any such option and this additional income tax will always be payable. So that was the reason why I was just raising a question that whether this would be a non-starter or probably there is a need for the government to reconsider this particular proposal of fixing this additional income tax liability. So this was about additional income tax friends. We also have some complicated provision for the purpose of computation of tax interest and fees. We have two subsections in 140B, subsection 1 and subsection 2. The first subsection deals with a case of a non-filer. And now updated ITR is filed for the first time. And subsection 2 deals with a case where ITR was already filed. Now updated ITR is filed revising this income. So for our discussion purpose also, we will be dividing both these cases separately. So this slide, which is in front of you, is dealing with a first case of a non-filer. I'm now filing updated ITR for the first time. What I'm supposed to pay is tax, interest, additional income tax, and some fees. So fees, yes, because I'm a non-filer. I had not my uh, file uh, my uh, ITR earlier within the due date, and therefore that 234F fees is payable. So whatever fees is applicable to you, that will, of course, be uh, payable at the time of filing of an updated return. Apart from this fees, when we come to a tax liability and interest, it's simple. It's in, in a normal manner in which you are otherwise supposed to compute your tax liability and interest. That is how you have to compute total tax minus your all uh, prepaid taxes, TDS, etc. And whatever interest under ABC, which is applicable, you have to compute and you have to pay. And this additional income tax at 25 percentage or 50 percentage, depending upon the year in which you are submitting this updated return, will be on some total of only tax and interest. Fortunately, the fees amount is not enhanced uh, because of this. The fees amount would remain the same. Additional income tax will be computed only on the tax and interest. Consider a second case, and here there are many complications. The second is a case where 
I had already filed my ITR earlier and now I'm submitting the updated ITR. So in this case, how am I supposed to compute my interest, uh, sorry, tax, interest and additional income tax? Fees won't be leviable at all because this is a case where I had already filed my ITR earlier. If your original ITR was a delayed ITR, you must have already paid that fees under 234F at that point in time. So today we are now not concerned with that fees is, which is payable under 234F at all. Let me come to a tax amount. How do you compute the tax amount? And there are two complications here that when you compute a tax amount, you have to compute in a normal manner, compute your total tax and reduce all types of prepared credits. That is uh, tax credits and tax reliefs, TTS, advanced tax or double tax reliefs, everything. But there is a catch over here. It says that any uh, credit which you want to avail in your updated ITR, which was not availed in the earlier ITR, so a fresh, credits you are claiming for TDS, etc. So uh, consider an example of I'm offering an additional income of 5 lakhs in this updated ITR and there was a corresponding TDS of 50,000. Now 1 lakh 50,000 is payable 30 percentage of my income ignoring cess and surcharge etc. So out of 150, 50,000 is already been deducted in the form of TDS. So which I need not pay now while filing my updated ITR, I'm eligible to take a credit. So we are talking about this additional credits. There is a condition that these additional credits can be availed in the updated ITR only if the corresponding income to this credit has been included in this updated ITR for the first time and it was not included in the earlier ITR which was filed. What does it mean simply? Simply it means that if in earlier ITR you have just missed out claiming some tax credits then this updated ITR, you cannot capture those tax credit even subject to the condition that their end result is still some additional tax liability payable. Even in that case, if the income was offered in earlier ITR, the tax credits on those income which were already offered in earlier ITR cannot be claimed for the first time in updated ITR. That opportunity is gone. You need to forget about those credits. Whatever other options are available to you for under, under section 119 for asking for condonation of delay, et cetera, that can be you know, explored. But this is not the option for you for just including the tax credit. Tax credit can be claimed only if the income is included, not otherwise. And then further it says that if you are already granted some refunds on the basis of your earlier ITR, whatever refund which was granted, you have to add it back to the tax liability. It's logical is because you are asked to compute the total tax liability and therefore on the revised income and therefore earlier refer granted has to be added back in order to arrive at the net amount. So the refund is also required to be added back while computing the amount of tax to be paid. Then come to the interest. We have three interest. First, 234A, I have put a question mark in my slide. I'm going to deal with this issue in the subsequent slide. Park it for the moment. Interest under section 234B is a simple one. Uh, in the normal manner in which you are computing your interest, otherwise in the same manner, you have to compute the interest. But as far as 234B interest is concerned, there is a change. 234B interest, otherwise we compute on the shortfall. Total amount of tax liability minus of prepaid taxes and advanced tax, which is already paid in the previous year. So in the shortfall of advanced tax, we compute the interest under section 234B. But for this purpose of updated ITR, this provision tells us that for computation of interest under section 234B, you will have to add the amount of refund to that shortfall. If earlier ITR was filed, refund was due and refund is already being granted to you, so since this refund has been granted wrongly to you, that refund amount has to be captured while computing this interest under section 234B. That's the change as far as this computation is concerned. And that additional income tax I have already clarified, it is 25% or 50% of some total of this net amount of tax or interest which you pay. Friends, this additional tax liability is to be computed not on the gross amount of additional income tax. So to carry, uh, uh, Carrying forward the same example, I am offering 5 lakhs of additional income on which there was a TDS of 50,000. If now net tax of 1 lakh is payable, this additional income tax will be computed at 25 or 50 percentage on this net amount of tax, not on the gross amount of tax liability before TDS. So that is uh, very clear from this particular provision. As far as this computation of interest is concerned, it always clarifies for all uh, interest section, it says that interest will have to be computed on the basis of now revised income offered. You cannot just 
simply compute on the basis of your income as per the original ITR. Since now you are offering more income, interest liability should also be more. Quite logical. No problem with respect to this. Further, section 234A and B, these two sections have been amended. Not to see, only A and B have been amended to provide that when you compute your interest, the additional income tax liability should not be considered in the computation of interest. What do I mean by this? It means that normally we have to compute the interest on the amount of tax liability. I mean that shortfall, total tax minus whatever prepared taxes and this TDS credits, etc. I'll call it as a shortfall. On that shortfall, we have to compute the interest of, for the period of delay. When you compute that shortfall, this amendment says that you need not include the amount of additional income tax in the amount of the shortfall, okay? Because additional income tax is otherwise nothing but a tax. And therefore, otherwise, if in the absence of this amendment, a possible interpretation was that tax will include additional income tax and therefore interest also becomes payable on the additional amount of income tax of 25 or 50 percentage. And therefore, they have provided this in the benefit of the taxpayers that for the purpose of interest computation, this additional income tax should not be considered because logically what will happen, it will, it will result into that circular reference. How circular reference is because if interest additional tax is to be considered, but additional tax is certain percentage of tax plus interest. So interest calculation is dependent upon additional income tax and additional income tax computation is dependent upon interest. So that is how it is. It will be resulting into a circular reference. So that circular reference has been removed and there is a provision to that particular effect. What are the other issues which are arising in the computation of interest? Multiple issues are arising. It will be quite complicated. And probably it will be only CPC who is going to resolve those issues. You and me can just discuss this issue and can think of the solution. But our solution would not be relevant ultimately because in practice, CPC is going to decide. But nevertheless, for the purpose of technical discussion, 234A interest liability, I had put a question mark in my slide as far as the second case was concerned. And why that question mark? is because if you refer that subsection 2 of new section 140B, which has been proposed, it refers categorically to interest on default in payment of advance tax or in deferment of advance tax. It doesn't refer to default interest as a result of default in furnishing of return, which is 234A precisely. So that is the reason why I had raised that question that since that reference to that interest payable upon default on furnishing the return is missing, does it mean that 234A interest need not be revised? So consider a case where I had already filed my ITR, but it was a delayed ITR after the due date. And therefore, 234A was applicable and I had already paid that interest at that point in time. But now I am filing updated ITR, revising my income upward. And therefore, the question is that whatever 234A interest which was payable originally, now whether that is also required to be modified by considering this upward revision in the income. The answer to that question is quite complicated, but it appears to me that though this reference is missing, but probably if you read section 234A in isolation, that revision in computation of interest under 234A would be required. In any case, uh, CPC is going to revise that computation of uh, 234A interest always. What about 234B on in a refund? You know, very important question. And perhaps this is a point where a strong representation is required is, that it talks about computing interest on the amount of refund which is already granted to me. But 234B interest, friends, as we know, the period for which this interest is required to be computed is right from 1st April of the assessment year. Now, quite possible that I have been granted this refund, obviously not on 1st April, but somewhere in the middle of assessment year. And now we see that returns having cl uh, refund claims of large amounts, still the refunds have not been granted. So what if the refund is being granted to me subsequent to 1st April? Do I still need to compute my interest on this refund amount right from the 1st April? As per the reading of the Act, it says so, but it's not logical. Perhaps they have missed out this point and therefore there is a need to represent this particular point. Then the last one under 234C. When I was just on the previous slide, I was just making a reference of the amendment in only 234A and B. Does it mean that in the absence of amendment in corresponding provision of 234C, when I'm computing my interest under 234C, do I have to include the amount of additional income tax? The answer is yes, because there is no amendment. 
the answer could be no because it is not logical and it is resulting into a circular reference perhaps that revision i mean that inclusion of additional income tax should not be required but there should be a suitable amendment to that particular effect in the act itself just one point to clarify that it is not a precondition that for filing of an updated return always there has to be a sum liability to pay additional income tax there could be a case where you have all satisfied all other conditions but you are not liable to pay any additional tax liability in spite of this you are still allowed to file an updated itr i'll take an example for the purpose of better understanding instead of technically just discussing this particular uh, scenario so just consider a case which is before you in my slide i had originally filed my itr declaring income of 10 lakhs there was a tax liability of 3 lakhs and at the same time there were some prepaid taxes in the form of tdas or advance tax etc amounting to 8 lakhs and therefore i had claimed a refund of 4 lakh 88000 and please note that this is a case where this refund has not been granted to me at all if the refund is already granted the end result would be totally different so since the refund is not granted during the pendency of processing and refund now i am revising this return i am filing an updated itr including more income of 2 lakhs into this tax liability will be increased my prepaid taxes is remaining the same assuming on this additional income of 2 lakhs there is no further credits etc and therefore my refund claim is reducing number 1 am i eligible to file the updated itr the answer is yes is because i am not increasing the refund i am not putting up a fresh claim of refund i am just reducing a claim of refund which is permissible okay and the second if i am allowed to file the updated itr am i required to pay an additional income tax in this case the answer is no is because additional income tax is at a given percentage of tax and interest which is payable net amount of tax and interest which is payable while filing the updated itr and here is a case where i have not, nothing to pay i had a refund claim to receive and i am reducing my claim of refund in during the pendency of this refund and therefore in the absence of any amount which is payable probably in additional income tax liability is not coming into picture and therefore there could be a case where additional income tax liability is not payable but still filing of an updated return might be permissible a few consequential amendment um, best judgment assessment cannot be made by the assessing officer if the updated return is filed because though there was a default in filing of a return but now you have cured the default by filing an updated itr and therefore best judgment assessment cannot be done the time limit for completion of the assessment 1433 or or 144 has been extended in this cases because updated itr itself can be filed in an extended timeline and therefore correspondingly there is a change that assessment now can be done in this case where the updated itr is filed not in every case is within 9 months from the end of the financial year in which that updated itr was filed so the assessment would be open for more period moment the updated itr is filed and the third and last is the change in the prosecution for the offence of non filing of a return under 139 you will not be prosecuted moment there is an updated return which is now filed under the new provision so this is a welcome change you will be given an immunity from the prosecution if you are filing an updated itr and friends i am just referring to an offence of non filing of itr only under 139 if there is an offence of non filing of itr under some other provision for example in response to a notice under 148 etc there is no escapement and this will work only for a prosecution for non filing of a return uh, under section 139 so with this uh, i have completed this uh, provisions of updated return in the next i will proceed with the uh, discussion on virtual digital assets sarath bhai question and answers at end if you permit or you want me to look at the question and answer because otherwise uh... yeah, yes sir yes sir we can take it at the end thank you thank you so next is interesting set of amendments dealing with uh, taxation of uh, cryptocurrencies bitcoins or now it has been called as uh, virtual digital asset so that is how this uh, uh bitcoin is looked at and uh, it has been now uh tax is being levied at 30 percentage on this income arising from a bitcoin so let's try to understand the amendments uh, dealing with the taxes on of uh, cryptocurrencies now to refer cryptocurrency would not be appropriate as far as the income tax act is concerned because we have been given a new term to this baby and this is called as a virtual digital asset vda 
and we have been given a definition under section 2 a new clause 47a is inserted friends i will not be able to make an analysis of this definition because we need a technical person to make us understand as to what all different terms are being used and how this has been defined you know it's beyond my capabilities to understand all this technical aspects uh, which have been used uh, in this particular definition so i'll just leave this to you but couple of important points which are coming from the definition which we need to understand it says number one that uh, all those uh, you know information or tokens etc whether they are generated through cryptographic means or otherwise would qualify to be called as virtual digital asset number one second in order to call any asset as a virtual digital asset it should be capable of transferring storing or trading into them electronically so it is only in that circumstances that particular asset can be referred as vda that is virtual digital asset and the last one is any other digital asset can be notified to be called as a virtual digital asset by a government through a notification for this particular purpose so this is a definition of virtual digital asset and then we have a second uh, amendment dealing with the taxation of this vdas and which is section 115 bbh so friends right from section 2 now we are traveling straight to section 115 bbh in between there is no amendment except for section 56 which i'm going to deal in uh, in the subsequent slide so what does section 115 bbh provides it is applicable with effect from assessment year 2324 and not to the past assessment year this section will apply if and only if the total income of that assessee includes income from transfer of any vda so the pre condition which is required to be satisfied in order to apply this provision is that there has to be first some income and moreover that income should be from transfer of any vda by me it is only in that case this provision will apply and not in any other case there might be some income might be possible that income has some connection with vda but if that income is not arising from transfer of vda this particular provision will not apply so if this provision is applicable because my income was including this income from transfer of the vda in that case what will be the consequences the consequences would be in that case that i will be liable to pay the tax at peak rate which is 30 percentage on this particular component of income so that means section 115 bbh what it does effectively is that a uh, exception has been carved out for the purpose of computing a tax liability and on this component of income arising from transfer of vda is being taxed at 30 percentage plus whatever surcharge it says whichever is applicable to you as per the other regular provisions of the finance act this is number 1 there are more consequences which will follow if your income includes income arising from transfer of vda and what all other consequences are second you will not be granted any deduction whatsoever of any expenditure or allowance from that particular income from transfer of vda so when i say no deduction would be granted a uh, obvious question which will arise that does it mean that the sale consideration would be taxed the answer is in third point the answer is no it says that you will be granted a cost of acquisition as a deduction but except for cost of acquisition no other deduction would be granted so if you have incurred some expenses for sale of cryptocurrencies etc those deduction cannot be granted only a cost of acquisition can be reduced the next point it says that even set off of losses under any other provisions of the act is not permissible against the income arising from transfer of vda so it is without set off of losses you will have to offer the income at gross level while computing your tax liability no set off against the income from vda then the last it says that if at all if you have a loss arising from transfer of vda then this loss from vda is also not permissible as a set off against income computed under some, any other provisions of the act and this loss you are even not allowed to carry forward this loss so if there is a loss you have to forget about that loss no benefit of set off so the first one is a restriction on an inward adjustment of some other losses against the income from vda and the second one is an restriction on outward adjustment if there is a loss from vda that loss is also not allowed to be set off against uh, any other income 
what are the uh, issues or important points which we need to understand from this amendment is is that what about head of income so since i mentioned that right from section 2 the next straight amendment is in section 115 bbh there is no amendment in between so there is no corresponding provision providing for the head of income under which this is taxable and therefore we will have to apply a regular provision to my mind in order to decide which under which head of income this income should be taxed and therefore the next question is that if this is a case of an investor into the cryptocurrencies etc whether this can be considered as a capital asset and therefore the resultant gain can be offered under the capital gain or not the answer to that question as it appears is that yes because these are vda these are assets and property of any kind can be considered as a capital asset there is no restriction on vda being considered as capital asset and therefore this can probably be considered as a capital asset and the resultant gain can be offered under the capital gain and if you are offering this under capital gain all other consequences will follow and therefore it goes without saying that if you have some exemption available under 54f it is permissible to claim that exemption that is not a deduction or an allowance probably uh the next is that what about the benefit of indexation if you are allowed to claim only a deduction of cost of acquisition in case if this is a long term capital asset whether indexation benefit can be claimed the answer to that question is no is because of express provision of 115 bbh which refers only to a cost of acquisition and if this is long term i have 112 which tells me that your long term capital gain will be taxed at 20% but now i have 115 bbh which tells me that this income will be taxed at 30% both will come in play which would we apply i think since 115 bbh is a specific provision dealing with taxation of income from transfer of vda that provision should be given a preference over section 112 the next is what if i have multiple or for example two transactions of vda one is resulting into a loss other is resulting into an income and that too in the same year can i set off this loss inter se against the income from other transactions of some other vda is that permissible it appears that yes that should be permit permissible because it says that the loss from vda cannot be set off against income under any other provisions of the act and therefore if you have an income under the very same provision under 115 bbh which is an income from vda probably that set off should be allowed and it should not be uh, restricted in that particular case there is no provision to bring uh, the income on the basis of fair value of vda transfer we know that we have provisions like 50 ca for example where you are transferring unquoted shares and if your fair value is higher than the consideration in that case your gain would be computed on the basis of fair value today as it stands we don't have any such provisions for the purpose of taxing this income arising from vda the next amendment is in section 56 and the amendment is very simple and very short the 56210 provision applies on the receipt of sum of money immovable property or some other specified property in the last and third category the word property is defined in an explanation add in include certain assets like shares or securities or bullions etc now there is an amendment in the definition of a property and by virtue of that amendment vda is also included in that list of properties for the purpose of section 56210 what does it mean that now any person who is receiving vda without any consideration or receiving vda for an inadequate consideration and the difference in aggregate for all such transaction is more than 50000 then the recipient would be liable to tax under section 56210 but subject to the exceptions like receipt from relatives or receipt on the occasion of marriage etc or uh, subject to those exception the taxability will be arising now under section 56 this amendment is effective from assessment year 2324 and moment i say that this is effective from ay 2324 the obvious next question is what about the transactions in the past year prior to ay 2324 and the answer is also obvious perhaps is that since now the property includes vda it means that earlier the word property was not including vda and this amendment with this is with prospective effect and therefore the existing provisions prior to this amendment are not capturing the receipt of vda without consideration or for an inadequate consideration the other provisions taxability under other provisions like like section 60 and etc might apply but certainly 56210 uh will not apply uh, in uh, this particular case 
when we are referring to or when we are reviewing this taxability under section 56210 we need to have backup valuation rule so we have rule 11 ua and i'm sure that this rule 11 ua will have to be modified for the purpose of prescribing a method in which you need to value this or uh, vda only in that case this 56210 work otherwise this will not work this income which we are talking about and arising under section 56210 This income won't be subject to a pick rate of thirty percentage under section hundred and fifteen BBH is because hundred and fifteen BBH is providing for taxability of income arising from transfer of VDA, and here it's an income arising from receipt of the VDA, not for from the transfer of VDA, and therefore hundred and fifteen BBH doesn't apply to income arising under fifty six two ten amended provision, and therefore that will have to be taxed. as per the whatever regular rates uh, which are applicable to you and all other consequences will follow your fair market value will be considered as a cost of acquisition of this vda and when you are subsequently transferring only with respect to additional gain you will be taxed and if there is a loss because your valuation today is higher and the value is falling thereafter that loss will not be allowed as a set off though you are already taxed under 56210 against any other income the last amendment with respect to vda is a new provision asking the payer to deduct tax at source under section 194s when he pays a consideration for transfer of vda to the transferor so now every person who is acquiring vda will have to deduct tax at source at the rate of 1 percentage under this new provision from the amount of consideration which he is responsible for paying for transfer of vda to him and this provision will apply only in a case where pay is a resident if the pay is a non resident other provisions will apply but here under 194s pay should be a resident and this tds is required to be deducted at the time of payment or at the time of credit whichever is earlier we have a proviso to this new provision of subsection uh, sorry uh, subsection 1 of this new provision of section 194s and what does that proviso provides it says that look when the consideration which you are paying for acquiring this vda to the transferor if that consideration is in kind or there is a transaction of exchange of one vda uh, against another vda so for example i am holding bitcoins and you are also holding some other tokens or some other cryptocurrency and both of us are exchanging this with uh, one another so it's also a barter exchange or where there is a consideration which is flowing from me in kind in such a case it says that if at all it's a transaction where partly in cash and partly in consideration and that cash component is sufficient is not sufficient to discharge your tds obligation so in a way it provides that in any transaction where there is either cash component is not there it's completely in kind or cash component is there but since it is only and partly that cash component is not sufficient to discharge the tds of 1 percentage in that case what should be done because this is a typical case where i am not paying any money and therefore since no money is flowing from me how do i deduct tax at source it says that nevertheless in that case you could not deduct tax at source is fine but what you need to do you means the person who is responsible for paying this consideration in kind is that you need to ensure that the tax has been paid in respect of such consideration for transfer of vda and that too before releasing this consideration so as a payer i will have to ensure that the tax whichever which was payable on this consideration which i am now paying before i release that consideration i will have to ensure that the tax has been paid this is an obligation under this new proviso and we will be dealing with this in the subsequent slide let me first complete the basics of section 194s it further says that uh, 203 and 206 aab which is uh, tds high rate of tds in case of non filer or 203 is obtaining ten number etc won't apply only for this purpose and it gives supremacy to 194s it says in any transaction where 194s applies you have to deduct tds under 194s and no other provisions of tds will apply even including the provision which was inserted last year tds by an e-commerce operator 194o that will also not apply and the effective date of this new provision of tds is 1st july 2022 not from 1st april but for a change for this provision provision it will apply from 1st of july 
what are the thresholds? The general threshold is 10,000. The, if the uh, total amount of consideration payable to one person, if it exceeds 10,000 a year, this TDS provision is applicable. But friends, just take care of this particular point because there is a, probably a misunderstanding on some part where you know, probably a view was being given that individual HR not having turnover exceeding 1 crore or 50 lakh should not be made subject to TDS. But that is not the case here. Unlike other provision, here it says that we will be giving a relief to those small taxpayers, individuals and HUF by providing higher threshold. But if the transaction is higher than this threshold, TDS will still apply. So only higher threshold benefit is given in a case of an individual or HUF who are either not having any business income or if they have the business income, but their turnover of the preceding financial year was not more than one crore or gross receipts not more than 50 lakhs for a business and a profession respectively. So that point needs to be you know, understood well. The TDS, you are not exempted from TDS, you are subject to TDS, but higher threshold of 50,000 is given for you. What are the issues which are arising from this new provisions of section 194S? I was referring to a point where there is a consideration in kind. The issue is that whether TDS will apply at the first place. Now you might be wondering as to why I'm raising this, this issue because I'm, I have told that there is a specific proviso to this effect. And I have also mentioned that in that case, the payer will have to ensure that the tax has been deducted. In spite of this, I'm raising an issue is because if you refer to the language of main subsection one, it says that a sum payable by way of a consideration for transfer of VDA, TDS is to be deducted at the time of credit or at the time of payment by any more. Now this language is sounding familiar. Is yes, because, because other provisions of sections are also using a similar language. 194C or you take it 194J or any other provision for that matter is using a similar terminology, either exactly same or something which is similar to this. And therefore under the existing provisions today, a controversy is arising that where a payer is not paying this in monetary form, but payer is discharging this liability in kind whether the existing provisions like 194C, et cetera, will apply or it won't apply. So there are few decisions, just to name few decisions, Red Chili's in the case of 194J, where actor was to be paid in kind, it held that TDA should not be made applicable. We have Karnataka High Court decision in the case of uh, Bruat Bangalore Palika, where upon compulsory acquisition, it was held that 194LA will not apply, where the consideration is discharged in the form of TDR and not in the form of money. But recently, uh, uh, some tribunal took a contrary view uh, in the case of, I think, Punjab state warehousing under section 194C and tribunal there took a view that if it is purely a barter exchange, it is a different matter. But if in a case where first the consideration is derived in monetary form in rupees, but it is only the form of consideration is it has been discharged in kind. In that case, TDA should be made applicable. So there is a controversy which is going on and therefore that issue will still be arising over here. But here this issue will slightly get diluted because probably the intention of the lawmaker is to apply TDS even in such a transaction of consideration in kind because that is the reason why otherwise proviso would work. Otherwise that proviso will never work where it says partly in cash and partly in kind and the cash component is not sufficient to meet the, to discharge TDS on whole amount. So when it says TDS on whole amount, probably the intention is very clear that TDS is made applicable even on the kind component and not only through the cash component. So that is how one needs to understand this. And therefore just keep this couple of points on hold for a moment, I'll go to the next slide. So in a case where there is a consideration in kind, now it also says that when one VDA is exchanged in another VDA, so in that case, what will happen is both the persons will have to ensure that the tax has been paid by the other respective persons in the very same transaction. Because in the very same example, I am holding Bitcoin, you are holding some other cryptocurrency and both of us are exchanging this one against another. So in that case, 194S will apply to me also, 194S will apply to you also. I will have to ensure whether you have paid the tax and you will have to also ensure whether I have paid the tax. I don't know how this will work, but this is how the provision is. Let's go one step further. In a normal transaction, not an exchange of VDA by another, but in a normal transaction, I'm a person selling some goods or providing some services and my customer pays to me in cryptocurrency through Bitcoin. 
Now, in this case, as a seller, I will have to deduct TDS under section 194S. Is this confusing? Because normally when I when we say TDAs, it is a payer who has to deduct TDAs. And here I am selling some goods and I am receiving some amount from my customer. But in spite of this, I am saying that as a seller, I would be liable to apply this TDS provisions of section 194S. Is why? Because here what happens is that the other person, that is my customer, is transferring VDA to me because I am receiving bitcoins from him. And as a consideration for transfer of this VDA or a Bitcoin to me, I am discharging my consideration, which is in kind, which is by sale of goods or by providing services to that recipient. I mean, that customer. So here it is a case where I'm giving some consideration in kind for transfer of VDA to me. And therefore, now on that amount of consideration, which I have, I have to pay in the form of selling of goods or providing of services, I will have to ensure that I'm complying with this requirement of 194S. That is, I will have to ensure that whether the tax has been paid or not, because this is a consideration in kind transaction. Okay. Now, when repetitively, I am saying that I have to ensure that whether the tax has been paid on this consideration or not. How do I ensure this is a question which is practically now arising. So we can go back to section 194B, which is TDS on winnings, etc. And there also there is a similar provision which says that if that winning is partly in cash, partly in kind, etc. In that case, that payer will have to ensure whether the tax has been paid. And it is 1997 circular which clarifies that one of the manner in which you can ensure is the other person, you can recover the amount of TDS from that other person in cash in monetary form, and you can pay the TDS under at the applicable rate, and you can discharge your obligation. So this, the clue can be derived uh, from that circular, which is in the context of section 194B. However, I was just wondering as to what if, even if the provisions are applicable to me, I'm talking about consideration in kind, friends. I'm not talking about monetary consideration transaction for getting VDA. So in those transactions where I'm receiving consideration in kind, what if I'm not complying with this provisions of 194S? Because it becomes cumbersome asking that person to give Bitcoin and plus some rupees so that I can discharge my TDS obligation under 194S. What can be the consequences? And I have an answer which is available from Karnataka High Court in the case of Hindustan Liver Limited, which says that the in this case, that person cannot be considered as an assassin default under 201 at all. Why is because the default under section 201 would trigger only in a case where I'm responsible for deducting tax at source and I have failed in deducting this or after deducting, I have failed in paying this TDS. And here is a case, the deduction itself is not applicable to me. This proviso doesn't say that I have to deduct. Proviso says that I have to ensure that the tax has been paid. That's all, nothing more than that. And therefore, since the requirement to deduct TDS is missing in this provision, Karnataka I could held that you cannot be considered as a defaulter SSE under section 201 at all. It only the consequences, penal consequences under 271C or a prosecution under section 276AB, which can follow, but certainly the default cannot be uh, triggered under section 201. However, for the purpose of this new provision of 194S, even this 271C or 276B have not been amended to make a reference to 194S. Today, as it stands, it refers only to 194B, uh, winning of uh, winning in kinds, etc. But it doesn't include reference to 194S. So till the time gov uh, government uh, uh, wakes up and make an amendment to 271C or 276B, there will be no consequences at all under this particular provision. In case of transactions taking place over crypto exchange, who is going to deduct TDS? There's a question. So probably it is that settlement agency who is paying this amount to the seller of uh, Bitcoins, et cetera, that settlement agency will have to take care of deducting tax at source. And when I say that it, this new provision will apply only when the payee is a resident, what if the in the transaction, the seller is a non-resident? Now there, the condition of taxability would depend upon where the asset is located. So we are talking about scope of total income section 5 read with section 9 in case of a non-resident. And if the asset is located in India or deemed to have been located in India, only in that case that income becomes taxable. So now here VDA, where is it located? Whether in India, outside India 
or nowhere in the virtual world. Nobody knows where it is located and therefore there will be a real, real issue. Take it other way around. Where a non-resident is buying bitcoins or some other VDA from a resident seller. Now, in that case, whether this TDS provision under 194S will apply or it won't apply is the question. Unless it is clarified, non-resident will have to take care of this obligation to deduct TDS under these new provisions of section 194S. So this was about uh, uh, virtual digital assets. Uh, I'll Since I was on TDS under section 194S, probably I'll also now just quickly cover the uh, other amendments in other TDS provisions. Just if someone can confirm that everything is going fine, uh, the screen and voice and everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but everything is going well. Yeah, okay, okay. So, uh, other TDS provisions, the amendments are the first one in section 194 IA, which is providing for TDS on immovable properties. A very simple and very one short and one line amendment. What was, what was happening under the existing provision is that TDS was required to be deducted only on the amount of consideration. And now the proposed amendment tells us that you have to deduct TDS on the amount of consideration or stamp duty value of that immobile property which you are acquiring, whichever is higher. It is on that higher amount now TDS is required to be deducted. And as a corollary, it now says that as far as the threshold limits of 50 lakhs is concerned, you have to look at agreement value or stamp duty value. I mean that consideration, sorry, referring agreement value would be technically wrong. So we have to refer to the consideration amount or the stamp duty value. In a case where any one of this is more than 50 lakhs, TDS is required to be deducted. So for example, I am selling an immobile property, I'm, I'm acquiring an immobile property, at, at an amount of 40 lakhs rupees. Otherwise, I was not required to deduct TDS. But in this transaction, if my immobile property is valued by stamp duty authorities at 60 lakhs, now here I will have to deduct this TDS and on an amount of 60 lakhs. So threshold limit is to be seen for both these amounts and not only uh, these uh, either of these two, that is consideration or a stamp duty valuation. And the meaning of stamp duty valuation, we have already been given a definition under section 56. And this amendment is effective from 1st of April, 2022. It appears to be a very simple amendment, but uh, when we go further, uh, we will realize that there are a lot of issues which are arising from this very simple amendment, which I've captured in just one slide, but the issues are running in two or three more slides. So what is the reason of this amendment as we have been explained in the memorandum that look, there is an inconsistency between a taxability provision and a TDS provision. Taxability under 43 CA or 50 C, it provides for taxability with respect to stamp duty value if it is higher, but TDS is on consideration amount. So there is a mismatch and therefore we want to remove this mismatch. Agreed, if that is the reason, then my counter question is that what about the tolerance benefit of 10% which is already provided in 43 CA or 50 C? When you are trying to match this provision, you should have matched this both this provision completely. Now here in TDS amendment, there is no corresponding benefit that if the difference is not more than 10 percentage of agreement value in that case you need not deduct tds on that difference so it is irrespective of the difference you should deduct as a payer you should deduct tds under 194 ia the recipient might take care of the taxability and as under the applicable provision at in his ends okay so as a payer you should not be concerned about this difference percentage in a case where an immobile property has been gifted by me it is irrespective of whether the recipient is taxable under 56.210 or not. If the recipient is not relative or no other exclusion is applicable of 56.210, might be possible that the recipient would be subject to tax in his ends on a stamp duty valuation of immobile property which I have gifted. But that doesn't mean that as a donor, I have to now deduct TDS under 194 IA on a stamp duty valuation. My view here is that the consideration or stamp duty value, whichever is higher, I think the interpretation to take that here consideration is nil and stamp duty valuation is higher is a wrong interpretation, according to me. According to me, there has to be, first of all, some consideration. And then only that comparison is possible. In a transaction which is without consideration, how can you say that there is a consideration, but this is a, the consideration amount is nil. And therefore, TDS, according to me here, won't apply. This amended provision will apply 
even in a case where you are buying a property from a builder, if your builder allows you to deduct TDS on that difference, I don't know, there will be a lot of practical difficulties and there will be a fight with the builder, but you will have to take care of this particular amended provision. Now, next is a very interesting issue. As we all know, under 194 IA, and for that matter, normally all other provision requires us to deduct tax at source at the time of payment or credit, whichever is earlier. Now, friends, please tell me that here there is a difference, which is a notional difference. And whether am I going to pay this difference or am I going to credit that difference in my books of accounts as a purchaser? The answer is obviously no. So in a case where this difference is neither paid nor credited, when should I deduct TDS? Or rather, the question is whether I should deduct TDS. The issue is whether the provision, though amended, is failing because there is no answer to that question. And if there is no answer to that question, how do I apply this TDS provision? The other argument would be probably from the other side can be is that if this is a case, this is a difficulty at the time of agreement you deduct or at the time of you know, making the final payment you should deduct or probably on a pro rata basis, you spread entire difference on a pro rata basis if you are paying this consideration in installment and then you accordingly discharge your TDS liability. But this is going to be a very complex issue if no clarity is being provided on, on this uh, very particular point. What if there are multiple owners, co-owners, more than one owner? So I am paying consideration to more than one person, but the immobile property is one. And since my immobile property is one, of course, the stamp duty valuation is only one. And therefore, how do I discharge my TDS obligation? The primary issue is that I have to compare my consideration vis-a-vis -vis stamp duty value. And here, logically, obviously, I should compare the consideration for the entire immobile property, not with respect to consideration which I am supposed to pay to every co-owner individually, because it will be an illogical comparison. But the question is that this difference, now I need to deduct TDAs in whose ends? Probably logical answer there would be that it is in the proportion in which you are paying the consideration. One should spread that difference in the very same proportion and accordingly should discharge this obligation as per the amended provision. Now, next is, uh, as we have been given a reason of amendment that taxability provision and the TDS provision should be made on par. Agreed. But friends, 194 IA requires us to deduct tax at source, not on an agreement value, but on a consideration amount. And here the term consideration is defined for this purpose in an explanation, which was introduced uh, just, I think, a year ago or two years ago. And whereas per explanation, we have been told that the consideration would include fees like car parking fees or club membership fees or uh, fees which is charged for electricity facility, water facilities, advanced maintenance fees, etc. And therefore, here, the comparison is an absurd comparison. And therefore, by including all this amount, if I have to compare the total amount of consideration with the stamp duty value, and whichever is higher, I have to deduct tax at source, probably that objective with which this amendment is brought is not getting fulfilled at all. And therefore, there is a need to reconsider this particular amended provision. This will not apply in case where there is a non-resident seller, obviously, because 194 IA is not applicable. The next amendment in the set of uh, amendments dealing with TDS is section 194R. A new provision is introduced in the Income Tax Act. Probably it appears to me or I feel always year after year when I make an analysis of finance bill is that this government is a TDS and TCS lover. If you look at last three or four years and make an analysis, they have introduced at least seven to eight altogether new provision. Apart from changing the existing provision, they have brought altogether new provisions dealing with TDAs and TCAs, TDAs on goods, TCAs on goods, and then e-commerce operator and whatnot. Okay. So we begin our journey from 194 TDAs on dividend, and then it started with 194A, et cetera. Today, we have reached to 194R. And probably uh, I have been called for the second year. If probably you will be calling me for third or fourth year, I am very sure that one day I'll be talking even on 194Z. And then there will be a time of you know referring to 194Z, A, Z, B, Z, C, whatnot. Okay. Okay. So leaving aside that, let us come to the uh, uh, amendment. The background of the amendment is we have a clause four in section 28, business income. It provides for taxes on on value of benefit or perquisite, which is arising from my business or profession, which I'm carrying on, whether that benefit or perquisite is in convertible into money or not. 
so whatever perquisites which i'm getting while i'm carrying on a business or something which is taxable under this clause 4 of section 28 very simple and uh, it has been mentioned in the memorandum that in many of these cases the recipients are not offering this amount of this perquisite to tax is because obviously this is not passed on through banking channel okay it is outside the banking channel this is benefit or perquisite basically mainly in kind and therefore it is not uh, traceable and therefore if the recipients are not offering any tax on this income it's practically very very difficult for the department to catch them and therefore what has been done is that the person who is providing this now is being asked to deduct tds under section 194r and they, that is how this transactions will get reported to them through 26 days etc through tds returns and probably if this income is not offered they will be able to make an assessment for including this particular amount of income that is the reason with this reason in mind now let us try to understand these provisions of section 194r which transaction would be now subject to tds now when we refer to a transaction friends please note that it is only for understanding the objective we are making a reference to 284 but the section per se 194r doesn't refer to 284 it captures the terminology of 284 but it doesn't refer directly that any amount which is chargeable to tax under 284 is subject to tds is not something like that so which transaction is now subject to tds it says any benefit or perquisite whether convertible into money or not and if it is arising in the course of the business or profession of the recipient the provider of that person will have to deduct this tds under this provision so exactly same terminology which i just referred as used in 284 so benefit or perquisite whether convertible into money or not that is the heart of this very section which we are trying to understand okay. so obviously since we are talking about 194r is not something an amendment under 195 the recipient of this benefit or perquisite should be a resident person for the purpose of applicability of this particular provision and what is the amount obviously logically it is the value or in multiple benefits the aggregate value of all benefits or perquisite that amount should be liable to tds under new provisions of 194 r the rate of tds is 10 percentage the threshold amount is 20000 the total value or aggregate value of all benefits to same person should be exceeding 20000 in order to uh, this tds provision to become applicable and one funny amendment is that if as compared to other provisions here the words used are person responsible for providing this benefit whereas in all other section the words used are person responsible for paying now here since we are talking about benefit or perquisite the word paying doesn't go with this and therefore logically person providing for this and therefore they had to define this word who is that person who can be considered as a person responsible for providing this benefit or perquisite because we have dedicated provision in the act which defines person responsible for paying and that definition won't apply here and therefore otherwise it was possible for someone to take a stand that tds provisions are ineffective individual or hcs small sized uh, taxpayers not having the turnover or gross receipts exceeding that same threshold of 1 crore or 50 lakhs for business or profession have been exempted from this requirement of tds even under this new provisions of 194r then further it provides the proviso which says that if this benefits or perquisite is in kind same similar to what i discuss with respect to tds under 194s and therefore now i'll not be spending too much of time on this it says that the person who is providing this benefits or perquisite in kind will have to ensure that the tax has been uh, paid in respect of this uh, benefit or perquisite before you release this particular benefits or perquisites now what are the important points from this particular amendment the words benefit or perquisite is something which is not defined for this purpose or not defined for that matter in the entire act and therefore how do you derive the meaning of this term benefits or perquisite probably since similar words as i was just explaining have already been used in 284 one can go to 284 refer to all those court decisions and take arrive uh, derive some guidance from all those court decisions in order to understand the meaning of this words benefits or perquisites but just for our discussion okay i can just share some of the examples i am just raising a question friends i'll not be deciding whether this particular transaction can it be said that it is resulting into a benefit or perquisite because we have very limited time and 
i am on slide number 51 i have about uh, you know more than 100 slides to deal with okay so just few examples which you know i could you know think of that a question would arise that whether tds requirement will be applicable or not so you know the first one to begin with very simple is uh, where in a case where uh, you know upon achieving certain amount of purchases the seller is giving some quantitative discount whether that amount passed on would be considered as benefits or perquisites or not uh, any you know free gift items which is given so if you are debiting some sales promotion expenses in your pnl account and which is consisting of some transactions which are which are resulting into benefits or perquisite for the recipient so for example there might be a practice uh, which is being followed by an sse whether in real or not i don't know but might be a practice that on some festival occasions that person might be you know buying some gift amounts for the purpose of distributing this gift amount among the customers etc if it is to an employee is not a transaction which needs to be considered so in that case of course this is resulting into some benefits or perquisite and probably tds provision will have to be complied with so such of the expenses would be on target when your assessment is taking place in order to understand by the assessing officer whether you have met with this requirement of tds under 194r or not and if not the resultant disallowance under 40a 1a can also apply there could be an extreme examples which one can consider or one can deliberate to decide a question whether these are resulting into a benefit or perquisite or not so for example there is a partnership firm owning several assets uh, including some of the residential properties and as a partner i am using or probably some of the commercial property residential property would not be a correct transaction so as a partner if i am using some of the assets of the partnership firm for which i am not paying any consideration to the firm at all because i have power to use those assets because i am a partner in the firm but otherwise for tax purpose these are two different assets can it not be say that here the partner is deriving some benefits or perquisite or even go on an extreme side where a uh, one of the group company is providing some benefits or perquisite to another group company in the form of interest free loans or a loan at a consistent rate of interest a lot of questions are going to arise the idea of raising all this question is to you know make you understand that this amendment is a far reaching i mean the consequences of this amendment are rather far reaching okay now the next question which i am raising over here is that when i say the benefits or perquisite whether the monetary benefits or perquisite would also be subject to tds over here when i was dealing with tds on crypto i dealt with a question of whether the consideration in kind would be subject to tds here i am dealing with an exactly opposite position that whether benefits or perquisite given in monetary form cash whether tds will apply under 194r or not why i am raising this question is because similar language used in 284 has been interpreted in a manner by bombay high court in the case of mahindra and mahindra where some portion of principal amount of loan was waived off by a bank there a view was taken that benefit or perquisite convertible into money when these words are used it implies that first of all benefit or perquisite should not be in a monetary form if that is in a monetary form the words use convertible into money or not is exactly not fitting with that particular language or rather they were not required and therefore any benefit or perquisite in monetary form was interpreted that they were not falling in 284 and that interpretation has been approved by a supreme court now if this is the case exactly same words have been used under 194r and therefore whether the same interpretation can it be extended to 194r here it would be little difficult to extend that interpretation is once again because of the proviso and that proviso tells us provides that in a case where benefit or perquisite is partly in cash and partly in kind so it indirectly means that benefit or perquisite could have also be in the form of cash and therefore probably the intention here appears to be to even capture this benefits or perquisite in a monetary form how to determine value is a question even uh, as on today under 284 now important issue is that tds provision will apply only if those benefits or perquisite provided are arising in the course of business or profession in the hands of the recipient now how as a person who is providing this benefit or perquisite on the earth would come to know that for the recipient this benefit or perquisite which i have provided is resulting into in the course of his business or not if i am dealing with my dealers etc is a different matter but consider a big companies for example like dmart dmart Now it comes out with a scheme, assuming hypothetically 
that any customer buying some goods from us in a particular period for a value exceeding some amount, in that case, some cashback or reward would be given. Now, in that case, how this company would come to know that my customers are buying these products from me, which are the, the transactions of this purchases of products from me for, for them, whether they are in the course of their business or whether they are meant for their personal consumption. It's very difficult to know this. And therefore, in a way, we are coming to a conclusion that it is impracticable to apply this TDS provisions uh, in such a scenario. The applicability date, there is a difference finance bill it applies from 1st of April 22, but memorandum, it says that this will apply from 1st of July 2022. So unless when this bill is converted into an act, an appropriate amendment is made, we have to make this provision applicable from 1st of April 2022. In case of a non-filer where higher rate of TDS is applicable, that is 206AB or 206CA, there is a slight tinkering with this definition of a specified person. They are amending this definition in a manner whereby now more and more person can be considered as a specified person. What is that change? The only change is that earlier this position of filing of ITR by that person, as well as the amount of total TDS or TCS was required to be seen for both the years, prior assessment years. But now it says that the status would be seen only for one prior assessment year and not for both the prior assessment year. So only status needs to be checked only for one prior assessment years for which the due date is expired and not for two years. That is the only change. And therefore, on now 1st of April, we will have to revise this list of non-filers for us and we need to accordingly apply this provision. One more slight change is. Uh, those three provisions have been carved out. That is 194 IA, IB, and M. Immobile property and TDS on those transactions by individual or HF, we were otherwise not covered by some other provision. They will also not be subject to this requirement of deducting TDS at higher rates for non-filers. The last amendment with respect to TDS, which I want to deal with is in section 201. This is an amendment where it's very difficult for someone to understand this amendment first. I have also tried to reconcile, but according to me, I have failed. But whatever I could, I, I, I could understand, I'll be just sharing this with you. The amendment says that when you are computing your interest under section 201, in a case where there is a delay in TDS or TDS transaction, the amendment says that where an assessing officer has passed the order, I'll just first read that amendment. It says that where an assessing officer has passed an order, considering you as an assessor in default under section 201, in that case, the interest shall be paid by you in accordance with that order. So what do we mean by this? AO has been made a king of this, okay? It is the assessing officer who will decide what is the amount of interest, not the law. And whatever assessing officer decides and writes in his assess uh, the order of default under 201, Interest will, be have, will have to be paid by you without raising any further question as per the order of the assessing officer. That is the manner or one of the manner in which the interpretation is possible of this amendment, but is not a correct interpretation. But the question is that can there be such a provision in the act that something which is payable by you, you will be paying this amount as it has been decided by the assessing officer. Or it should be in a manner that this will be payable by you in some other manner which has been provided in the act. If the tax is charged in the act, I have to pay the tax in accordance with the act. It, there cannot be a provision that as whatever assessing officer is deciding that this is a tax which is payable by you, it's required to be paid by you. So this is a completely unacceptable provision. It has been brought in effect from 1st of April 2022. But I was on the reason of this amendment. What is that reason? Probably if you read 2011A subsection, which provides for the manner of computing the interest, one and a half percentage till the time of deduction and then one percentage that differ, uh, different rates of interest which are applicable. If you read that provision, the period is broken in a manner where it refers to a date on which the tax has been deducted. And therefore, in a case where I have not deducted tax at all, I just failed, I have failed in deducting that tax. Probably that manner of computation will not work because their date of deduction of tax is missing. And probably that is the reason why they wanted to overcome such a scenario, but they could not think of what could be the alternative manner of computation. And therefore, they simply write that whatever assessing officer is deciding, now you have to pay in accordance with the order of assessing officer. 
So now I'll go to the uh, very important and a very harsh amendment in section 68 with respect to a source of source. So section 68 today as it stands, you know, all those interpretations coming at rescue of the SSE right from lovely exports and then further interpreted by Supreme Court in last decision of NRS Steel, et cetera. And read with 2012 amendment, inserting a proviso, casting that onus uh, 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 on the SSE to prove source of source. That in a case where a closely held company is receiving share capital, that company will have to prove even the source of that amount in the hands of the shareholder. And just by proving source in the hands of the company is not enough. They will have to go one step further. Now, there are many decisions. I've just named two decisions in my slide, but in fact, there are a number of decisions of high courts, which says that in case of this loans, et cetera, transaction where section 68, unless that second proviso is applicable, there is no requirement for the borrower to explain and prove what is the source in the hands of the creditor. But now memorandum says, if you read that sentence from the memorandum, which I've captured in my slide, it says that certain judicial pronouncement have created doubts about the onus of proof and the requirements of this section, particularly in cases where the sum which is credited as a loan or borrowing. Now question is, is this correct? First of all, was there any doubt on the judicial interpretation? The provision was very clear. Even in 2012, when you inserted the proviso, you made it applicable only for share capital received by closely held company. It indirectly proves that in no other transaction, the source or source was required to be proved. Nevertheless, forget about that uh, uh, comment uh, in the memorandum. What is that amendment? Now a new proviso has been added, which simply say that if any amount which is credited in the books to which section 68 was applicable, otherwise, if that amount is consisting of loan or borrowing or any such amount by whatever name called, in that case, even the creditor will also have to offer an explanation about the nature and source of that amount in his hands. And that too, to the satisfaction of the assessing officer. That is the amendment. I just refer to the language of that amendment as per memorandum. If you read memorandum, it, it, it is even wider. It says loan or borrowing or any other liability credited in the books. But the uh, language in the bill is not supporting this any other liability. Language in the bill is any such amount. So that amount, other amount should also be in the nature of loan or borrowing. It cannot be any and each and every liability credited in the books, whether it's loan or borrowing or otherwise this amendment is applicable. That is not the correct way of reading this amendment. It should be loan or borrowing or any such amount by whatever name called. It is only to that this provision is applicable. The only exception is where the creditor is a venture capital fund or a venture capital company, a similar exclusion, which is also applicable for share capital received by a closely held company. That is the only exception. And this is effective from assessment year 23-24. I've just given a comparison between existing and new, which I'll just leave it for your benefit in my presentation. What are the important points which, which are emerging from this particular amendment? One is what are the consequences of non-compliance with this provision? The consequences are too harsh. We know 115 BBE, the tax would be at 78 percentage. And if you're caught in the assessment, it will be further enhanced by a penalty under the whatever provision which is applicable. There are no exceptions for any kind of genuine cases except of a transaction of this venture capital company or a fund. What do I mean by this? Each and every loan transaction or a borrowing transaction on the earth would now be subject to this further test of source of source under this amended provisions of section 68. Don't you think it is too harsh? It is only because just one or two percentage of total loan transactions you feel that there's something which is wrong or there is a tax evasion or there is a scheme of money laundering, etc. Whether you want to put such an onerous responsibility on all kinds of transactions of loans or borrowing is something which is not fair and not acceptable. Just hypothetically area or technically, if you consider the consequences of this amendment, I know that in practice, provision cannot be made applicable in such a manner. But the law doesn't provide for any kind of an exceptions. So what can be the consequences? Technically, if someone is borrowing something from a bank, even in that case, this amended provision is applicable. The exception is only for a venture capital or a venture capital fund, not 
with respect to a transaction with a bank and therefore even a borrower raising some finance from the bank this provision is applicable and technically speaking the officer can ask him that you prove or explain what is the source of this amount in the hands of the bank now how is that possible or consider a reverse case where bank is borrowing something from someone else even the bank can be asked that you prove what is the source of this amount in the hands of the person from whom you have borrowed this amount as a bank the bank is itself in the business of this so technically speaking even this deposits with the bank savings bank deposits or fixed deposits are nothing but loans or borrowings to my mind because this is this is how it has been recorded in their books and therefore before you deposit any amount now bank should ask you that what is the source of this amount in your hands you please explain give us a document because otherwise the section 68 is is going to hit us just imagine the consequences of this very simple amendment which has been brought without thinking as to whether this is something which is really justified or not the company now raising debentures even a listed company coming out with debenture issues or bond issues all these are loans or borrowings or any such amount by whatever name called and now they will be subject to this further test as per this amended provision unless this provision is suitably modified and are uh, even uh, uh, sufficient safeguards have been given in this particular amended provision to make it non applicable for all this kind of genuine cases now other relevant question is to what extent i am i am supposed to prove source of source there is no clarity on this okay whether if i just provide a bank statement and there is no cash deposit uh, which is you know then followed by amount given to me as a loan is that sufficient there is no answer which is available to this but it says that creditor will have to prove what is the source of this and therefore he will have to explain from where he got this particular money the next is very important what if it is found that the source of source is explainable he can explain from where he got this money but the tax has not been paid by that creditor or on that particular source of source whether i can be made subject to tax or that creditor's assessment needs to be reopened and he should be taxed according to me it's a creditor's assessment which is required to be uh, reopened at moment i have explained the source of source i have discharged my owners and there is nothing more than this Uh, which can be done in my hands another amendment is with respect to a set off of loss a new section 79a has been inserted denying set off of loss in a very specific situation which is covered by this new provision of 79a let's first try to understand what is the background of this amendment today as per the current provision in section 115 bbe it provides that set off of loss is not permissible against any income which is an income from an unexplained source that is under section 68 69 69b etc but it doesn't apply to an income the source of which is explainable but it is an undisclosed income so first of all we need to understand the distinction between these two types of income the first one is an income the source of that income itself is not explained or not explainable from where i got this money i am not answering that question the source is a question mark and the other one is an income the source of which is explainable but on that i have not paid the tax so for example i can give a very simple example is a case where i have earned rental income rent income has been credited in my bank account the source of which is explainable that i have earned this rent income but it is found that tax has not been paid on this rent income so it is an income the source of which is explainable and since it is explainable it can be brought to tax under section 115 bbe if it can be brought to tax under section 115 bbe the set off of loss today is permissible from any other sources against this particular income subject to the other provisions which are applicable and therefore it has been mentioned that during the course of search and survey etc in lot of cases such undisclosed income is found though the source of this undisclosed income is explainable and therefore 115 bbe doesn't apply and therefore the ssc is uh, able to set off the losses against this particular income they don't like this and therefore they have introduced an amendment which is with effect from assessment year 22 23 it says notwithstanding anything contained in any other provisions of the act a non obstant clause and it says that this provision will apply in a case where there is a search requisition or a survey other than a tds survey 
and as a consequence of the search or survey etc now the income of the ssc includes any undisclosed income undisclosed income is a term which is defined for this purpose but i have already given you an example we will be dealing with that definition once again for your benefits and therefore if as a result of search now income includes any such undisclosed income against this undisclosed income you will not be allowed to claim set off of any brought forward losses any current years losses or any unabsorbed depreciation under section 322 no set off is permissible and without this set off you will have to offer this income to tax undisclosed income is something which is defined as i mentioned to you there is an explanation which is something which is exactly identical to this explanation which is provided in section 271 ab for the purpose of levy of penalty so i'll not go into the details of this definition but it says that the income which is found which is represented by any assets books etc which was not recorded in your regular books before the date before the survey the search or survey took place or income represented by an expense entry which do recorded in the books prior to search survey etc but because of this search etc this expense entry is found to be false so either way you will be caught and that amount will be considered bogus purchase for example in case of the second one that amount would be considered as an undisclosed income the important points which are arising from this particular amendment is number one and very very important is that whether this restriction on set off of loss will it apply only in the case in whose case the search or survey is conducted or it can even apply in the case of a third party's assessment where the addition is made because of the search or survey in some other person's case if you are not clear let me give you a very simple and a very common example there is a search in the builder's case some diaries or some documents are found wherein receipt of on money is recorded i was a one of the buyer and it is found in my transaction i have paid some x amount of on money now this income would be becoming taxable in my hands assuming that i am able to explain what is the source if i am not able to explain this will be added under section 68 etc and 115 bb clearly prohibit set off of loss that is not the case i am able to explain what is the source but it is found that i had not paid the tax on this whether this provision will apply this question is arising because your though income is added in my hands but the search had not taken place in my hands search had taken place in someone else's case Now, if you literally read this amend a new section which is proposed to be inserted, it doesn't categorically say that the search should be in the SSC's case. It says, "Consequent to search under Section One Thirty Two, if income of any SSC includes this undisclosed income, so might be an, a possible interpretation that even in search of someone else's case, if some undisclosed income is found, probably the set off of loss won't be allowed." the restriction is on unabsorbed depreciation but not on the current years depreciation so that can be claimed friends this income would be subject to tax at the regular rate which is applicable to you not at 30 percentage this is not a provision for providing a special rate of tax this is a provision only providing for prohibition on set off of losses so for example due to search some sale document of properties are found which is taxable as my long term capital gain and which was not already offered to tax the rate of tax on this long term capital gain would be still 20 percentage but with the condition that i cannot set off any other losses against this particular long term capital gain if the search is being conducted now after this amendment but income of some earlier years are found whether this provision will apply there answer is no clearly because this is effective only from assessment year 22 23 whether the internal set off is possible so there are multiple transactions which are undisclosed which are found some of them are resulting into income some of them are resulting into losses whether i can enter say set off this losses and income and in aggregate i see that whether there is a net undisclosed income and then other losses are not set off or cannot be set off or even within this undisclosed transaction whether this restriction will apply this is a question for which answer is not available but the undisclosed income always uh, in, in practice is looked at in totality and therefore it's possible for someone to take a position that this internal set off is something which should be uh, permitted i'll go to the uh, faceless uh, amendment dealing with faceless amendments i have another two to three groups of amendments uh, to deal with it's uh, 
eighteen twenty uh, around. I have uh, Sarath Bhai. How many? How much more time? Sir, sir, ten to fifteen minutes more, sir. Okay, 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 okay fine. So uh, this is the position yeah. after introduction of this uh, faceless assessments. Uh, it's creating a lot of difficulties more for the department as compared to the difficulties for the taxpayers. So there are changes which have been proposed in the provisions dealing with faceless assessments. Uh, so I'm not going to deal with each and every change which has taken place in this provisions dealing with faceless assessment. Just few of the conceptual changes is the regional center has been removed. Now we'll be, we are going to have only one national center. The entire procedure, which was too lengthy and complicated, probably their department could not even understand or make it effective. And therefore entire procedure is shortened. There was possibility of multiple layering of assessment units. So one case could travel from one assessment unit to another assessment unit whenever it is subject to a review. Now that has been removed that only one assessment unit will, will be involved in any one particular assessment and not more than one. So what is the change in the procedure for your benefits? I have given in my words, whatever I could, uh, giving a comparison is what, you, what, what is the existing pro uh, procedure step by step and what is the proposed procedure step by step. I'll not, I'm not going to discuss the entire procedure and the amended one. But just to you know, just give you a glimpse of this amendment is that in the existing one, there were multiple types of the order which were required to be passed. First draft assessment order, and then revised draft assessment order, and then final assessment order, and then finally the assessment order. Now that is not the case. If you look at the uh, last column, there would be only one first is ILDP, which is income or loss determination proposal, which will go to a national center, if national center through system, if it decides that this is required to be reviewed, it will be assigned to an RU, which is a review unit. Review unit will send a review report. And on the basis, if the review report is received of, there is no review on that basis, the same assessment unit now will be finalizing the assessment and then will be handing over the draft assessment order to national center. And then national center would proceed for the purpose of closure of the assessment proceeding. So this procedure, which was quite complicated even for them has been simplified a great. So it is an ease of doing government business for them as far as this uh, amendment is concerned. One of the major change noteworthy is that in the earlier provision, allowing personal uh, hearing through a video conferencing was at the discretion, was at the mercy of that principal commissioner, et cetera, of that center. Now it is not so, it has been made mandatory. So once you request for this opportunity of personal hearing through video conferencing, that is required to be granted, okay? And the last and very important one, as far as this faceless assessment is concerned, subsection nine of 144B was providing that notwithstanding anything contained, if there is any lapse on the part of the uh, this uh, officers, uh, in following the entire procedure laid down, in that case, the entire assessment was becoming a non-est. And a lot of high courts, reads were filed and on this basis of subsection 9. So, for example, there was a need to serve a draft order if there is a variation. So, if the draft order has not been served and assessment is directly completed, the high courts took a view that it is in violation of the provisions or procedure laid down in other subsection of 144B and therefore as per subsection 9, that entire assessment was becoming non-est. Non-est means entire assessment was invalidated. It was not a case where that officer was given a re-opportunity to do this. Now it was creating a trouble. A lot of cases, the assessments were done in violation and therefore they were struck down by the high courts in this, those writ petition. And therefore now this subsection nine has been omitted. It's fine. But this has been omitted with retrospective effect from 1st of April 2021, in spite of that promise which was made that no retrospective amendments will be brought uh, by this particular government. So a lot of assessments uh, which were invalidated are will be impacted by uh, this particular amendment and courts will now be taking a fresh position in light of this amended provision. But indirectly, I was just, you know, just one point which, uh, you know, in, implies that now because of this omission of this particular subsection, it is an open license which is given to the assessment officers that this is the procedure. You're following, fine. If you are not following, then also it's fine. The assessment would not become non in any circumstances. Uh, any lapse in the, following this procedure, 
uh, there would be a re-chance or a re-opportunity would, which would be given to the assessing officer. That is what it means. Coming to reassessment, a hot topic of controversy today is notices under section 148, which were issued after 31st of March 21, without complying with the new set of provisions of section 147, etc. Many high courts have struck down these notices. I'll not go into the details of this, except for one, Chhattisgarh High Court, we have favorable rulings from several high courts. Just please note that there is no amendment for validating these notices as it stands today in the Finance Bill 2022, because probably uh, that department have uh, filed SLP before Supreme Court, and therefore if the amendment is brought here, uh, it will be making their case weaker there. A few of the amendments, just minor one, I will not be dealing with, for example, instead of referring to any final objection of CNDG, now it has been amended to refer any audit objection. It need not be a final one or it need not be a CNDG, one internal audit objection will do for this purpose of reassessment. So there are petty amendments in this entire uh, set of provisions dealing with reassessment. I am just uh, sharing this for your benefits in my presentation. Just a uh, couple of them which are very important, which we need to you know, deliberate is the time limit for issuing notice under section 148. Last year, this uh, provisions were changed and it was being I mean, mentioned that we are simplifying this procedure in favor of the taxpayers. The earlier, the time limit, which was quite longer, up to six years available, even in a case where income escaping the assessment is more than one lakh, which was available, they have rightly reduced that time limit that in normally only three years would be available. Only in exceptional circumstances, beyond three years, up to 10 years would be available. And there, there was a monetary threshold of 50 lakhs, which was being capped instead of just one lakh. Now today, see what is the change which they have brought uh, in this particular additional time limit beyond three years, up to 10 years, which was available in this case. So I have tried to capture the wordings more or less in the same manner in my slide. And what is the present position today? The present position today is that this extended time up to 10 years was available, subject to these two things that one is income escaping the assessment should have been represented in the form of some assets. And second, the threshold limit of 50 lakhs was applicable for that very assessment year for which the notice is intended to be issued under section 148. This is the present provision. And now this is the amended provision. Two changes at both the places. The scope is widened. It says the amended provision now provides that income escaping the assessment did not only be represented in the asset. Alternatively, it, it, it could have been represented in the form of some expenditure in respect of a transaction or an event or it could have been represented by any entries in the books of account. So two wide scope which has been provided enabling the assessing officer to issue now a notice under section 148. The first one is fine, reasonable, but look at the second change. That monetary threshold of 50 lakhs or more in the existing provision, there were words for that year. And it clearly implied that the threshold of 50 lakhs income should have escaped assessment for an amount of 50 lakhs or more for that particular year for which the notice is proposed to be issued. Now these words for that year have been removed. What does it imply? Clearly it implies that this threshold of 50 lakhs is now not applicable for a single assessment year, but this 50 lakhs threshold can be made applicable for more than one assessment year. And if my, we might feel that there is uh, there is an error in this. It can't be so, but that is not the uh, correct way to you know uh, understand this particular provision is because a new subsection subsection one a supporting this is also inserted and look at this new subsection one a. It further says that when an income escaping assessment is found to be representing assets or expenditure, and the corresponding amount invested in the asset or amount of expenditure is spread over more than one year within that limit of 10 years. In that case, notice is required to be issued for every assessment year. So this also further supports that now that monetary threshold of 50 lakhs is not to be seen for one particular assessment year within that uh, fourth to 10th year, but it can be seen in totality. So if in totality there is some assets or expense or some entries which are found 
having total volume or value of more than 50 lakhs, though it is spread over more than one year, for all the years which are involved with respect to this assets entry or expenses, the notices under section 148 can now be issued under this amended provision. There is a, some minor change in the procedure and requirement of approval, etc. I'll just uh, skip those uh, changes. The next one is COVID exemption. I'll also skip this because this is coming from that press release. There's no uh, change. Otherwise, this position was already established. It was already promised in this press release. So uh, I'm just leaving this particular uh, uh, the provision in my slide for the purpose of your reference. Only point to be seen over here is that there is a monetary limit of threshold of 10 lakhs, which is provided in case of a compensation received on death of a person due to COVID. Whether that threshold of 10 lakhs, will it apply for uh, one year or it, it needs to be applied individually for one year it, or it should be seen uh, in totality for more than one year, wherever this compensation is received. The last set of amendment before I end my presentation, I have five more minutes, uh, Sharad Bhai. Yes, sir, you yeah, can continue. Yes, 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 sir. You can yeah, continue. Thank you. So, much. Thank you. So, so, I have last set of amendments dealing with some of the disallowances uh, while computing the income of a person. So, first one is a 14A disallowance. So, since now dividend income has become taxable, this amendment would not be very, very relevant today. But for whatever past assessments or appeals which are going on, this amendment would be relevant. Very limited applicability. So, I'll just quickly summarize that a view was prevailing that in a particular year where exempt income has not been received, not earned, in that year, disallowance on under 14A won't apply. Now, this view, which was flowing from many high court decisions approved by Supreme Court in SLP, it has been overruled. There is an explanation which is inserted, but from 1st of April 22, which says that irrespective of whether income is accruing, exempt income is accruing or received, if the expenses are incurred in relation to such an exempt income, these expenses are required to be disallowed. There will be so many debates on so many other points, which uh, I'm not just putting too much of time into this. Uh, education says, which is payable under the Income Tax Act, high courts have taken a view, including Bombay High Court in Sesa Goa, that says is a deductible expenditure. The disallowance with respect to income tax, which is already there in 40, won't apply to assess. Now there is an explanation inserted with retrospective effect right from 2005-6 AY. It says that clarificatory amendment by way of an explanation, it says that tax will always include surcharge or assess by whatever name called and therefore no uh, deduction can be claimed with respect to such assess amount which is payable under income tax at all. The Next one, which is very important for us to understand for pharmaceutical companies or even it has applicability even with respect to some other assesses as well. So what had happened for this uh, with respect to this particular transaction was that 37.1 today disallows any expenditure which is incurred, which is prohibited under any law or for an offense which is uh, under any law. And there, though the circular was assured that pharma companies providing some benefits or freebies to practitioners, doctors, uh, which is not permissible under IMC regulation that it, no deduction would be allowed. Many tribunal decisions in recent past had taken a view that IMC's regulation is prohibiting the doctors to receive this. It can't prohibit or doesn't prohibit the pharma company from providing this. So it was being looked at with such a minute difference. And therefore, a view is taken that IMC doesn't have any jurisdiction over pharma companies. It can have a jurisdiction only on doctors. And therefore, a view was given by the ITAT decision that deduction should be granted. However, recently, Honorable uh, uh, Member of Mumbai ITAT, Mr. Pramod Kumar, discussed this issue at length and, and said that something which is prohibited uh, in the ends of the recipient, how can a person give this? And therefore, a view was given that this is required to be disallowed. This view has been confirmed by way of an amendment. Now it says that any benefit or perquisite which is provided, if its acceptance is prohibited, then in the hands of the person providing this, there no deduction shall be granted. So all pharma companies now will have to bear with this uh, consequences. It further says any expenditure in the form of compounding fees, which is payable to cure any offense or any default, that will also not be deductible. So if builders are paying any compounding fees to local authorities, uh, for any violation in uh, meeting the conditions, that will also be subject to now a disallowance. But everything with effect from 1st of April 22, uh, 
Uh, issue might arise that whether this can be uh, made applicable with retrospective effect because the explanation has been inserted to say that for the purpose of removal of doubt. But there, even in the last year, 3615A amendment was brought uh, with similar wordings. And we have already some tribunal decision, I think one from Hyderabad tribunal in the case of Sells Gitter, which says that though the uh, explanation is worded that it is for removal of doubt, the explanation is inserted with effect from a particular date will always apply from that date only and not to the past assessment year. The amendment in 43B is a simple one which says that if the interest amount which is not paid, which was otherwise required to be disallowed, if it was payable to banks or some other financial institutions, etc., in that case, if that interest has been converted into any debenture or such similar instrument, this will not be construed as a payment. So otherwise it was possible to argue that this is a constructive payment. Today we already have a restriction when interest is converted into some loans or borrowings. That restriction is now widened that even if interest is converted into some debentures or similar other financial instrument, this will not be construed as a payment and therefore uh, deduction cannot be claimed. The issue is that this amendment talks about debenture or some other in similar instrument because of which the liability to pay is deferred. Now, what if, if I'm converting interest in such an instrument where liability is not just deferred, but liability is seized. So for example, conversion of this into an instrument like equity or compulsorily convertible debentures, et cetera, what will happen is an issue. The last one in case of disallowance is bonus stripping. So today, 94.8 bonus stripping was applicable only with respect to mutual fund units. Now the scope of this bonus stripping provision is extended even to cover any types of securities and therefore now this will even to apply to shares also. So what will be happening in case of shares transaction is shares acquired within a period of three months prior to the record date of bonus sold within nine months after that record date. And if there is a loss from the original holding, which I've sold, that loss will be ignored and that loss will be now considered as cost of acquisition of this bonus shares. That is in effect the amendment is, but this will apply only with effect from assessment year 23, 24, not to the prior assessment year. I don't know why such complication is being created. Probably there was an, a possibility was to provide for a simple provision to say that the cost will be averaged out. You know, to just to say that loss will be ignored and that loss will be considered as a cost of acquisition is very difficult to keep a track of uh, every such transaction of uh, bonus and then to consider the loss as a cost of this bonus shares. Just one point from this miscellaneous part is penalty under 272A is increased five times from 100 rupees to 500 rupees for all those failures which are covered by subsection 2. So, the, you know, in our day-to-day -day practice, the defaults like in is delay in issuing certificates of TDS, DCAs, or submission of 197A declaration, etc. Now, the uh, person would be penalized uh, at 500 rupees for every day of default. So, uh, probably, friends, uh, yeah, and 115 BAB, sorry, I just missed this last one. Uh, manufacturing company, a concessional tax rate of 15 percentage, which had already been provided, there, there was one of the condition was that manufacturing or production should have been commenced uh, by 31st of March 23. Now, because of this COVID disturbance, uh, one more year is granted that you can commence your manufacturing or production by 31st of March 2024. Even in that case, you will be considered as an eligible company for the purpose of availing uh, this concessional rate of tax of 15 percentage under section 115 BAB. So that's all, friend, and thank you very much uh, to Borivali Study Circle and all the members uh, patiently hearing my speech uh, without any questions in between. Uh, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. There, if there are any questions, uh, whatever you know, uh, organizers decide, I'll uh, follow that discipline. Thank you very much, and I hand over the proceedings to the organizers. Thank you, thank you, Badresh Bhai. Thank you very much. Sir, we have all also have one more speaker with us, Mr. Sujit, Surjit Haljar. He's a chartered accountant. Uh, yesterday, normally in all the seminars, we used to have impact of budget on income tax on or in, impact of budget on income tax and capital market. And yesterday, uh, coincidentally, we had director of upstocks with us and uh, he agreed to give a glimpse of uh, impact of budget on capital market with his uh, excellent team. 
so mr ca surjit haljar is with us so i would request pradeep chandwani to please give a brief introduction to our next speaker so i think he can give a keynote speech on the impact of budget on capital market uh, mr pradeep chandwani yeah thank you thank you nilesh ma'am well uh, we welcome today's speaker ca surjit haljar who has been associated with the capital market for the past 6 years he had been earlier associated with the firm chai and ramaya chartered accountants currently he is assisting uh, up stocks in all the exchange and listing compliances for the past 3 years so we welcome surjit haldar sir to for this presentation and i would request him to start his presentation um, thank you so much um, sir actually uh, this was a really short notice for me so i don't have a presentation to be showed on screen so i'll um uh, have a like uh, talk on this session like how this budget had an effect uh, on the uh, capital market so sir so, our members will be happy with only one or two tips which will make them millionaires and they <laughs> <laughs> sir so the this time this times budget actually was not having a lot of uh, things to be uh, telling from capital markets point of view capital markets there was only a few little bit changes that was uh, brought in uh, one of that uh, would be which i can uh, say is uh, identification of cryptocurrencies by our income tax department uh, so <clears throat> the uh, finance minister uh, stated in her uh, speech that the increase in trading in the cryptocurrencies has mandated them to uh introduce the cryptocurrencies trading in the uh, ambit of tax like so say so they introduced something called as the virtual digital asset in this budget uh, which is nothing but any form of an asset which is held by any person in the form of a token or a code or a number which is not a currency <clears throat> so any profit arising out of a uh, sale of such an asset would be taxed at the rate of uh, 30% from 1st of april 2023 for calculation purposes of profit no deduction of expenses uh, shall be allowed uh, and also if there is any loss in this transactions of uh, virtual uh, asset uh, such losses cannot be adjusted against any other income and also such uh, losses cannot be carried forward for a uh, set of purposes for any other uh, assessment years uh, there was one more provision which was introduced in this um, was that uh, in the form of tds so whenever uh, any sum of uh, money is uh, paid to the recipient or credited to the recipient whichever is earlier Uh, such uh, uh, sum uh, has to be uh, reduced by one percent of TDS by the payer, and these provisions would apply from first of uh, July two thousand twenty-two. So, uh, what we understand is that uh, this crypto, or rather the uh, what we now would call as the virtual digital asset, are currently unregulated in India. however these provisions which are brought in this budget indicates uh, a beginning towards regulating these uh, virtual digital assets maybe through existing authorities like rbi or sebi or they may introduce a completely new authority who would specialize in uh, trading of these kind of uh, assets uh, since currently uh, these uh, assets are not regulated Uh, any stock broker who is registered under the sebi under this act cannot actually offer trading in these uh, currencies or rather these assets however what we understand is whenever these get regulated we understand at least the top brokers would be very swift uh, in introducing the trading of these uh, assets on their platform so this was one of the uh, major a uh, thing that was uh, introduced in this budget and will affect the capital markets going ahead uh, one other important uh, uh, change that was brought in was capping of a uh, surcharge for people persons having uh, income under section 115 ad 
so the uh, highest lab which this section had uh, of surcharge was of 37% which has been capped to 15% now from the coming fi so we understand that surcharge can at such high rate be um, uh, quite a good chunk of amount that uh, gets deducted from one's profit uh, so capping this at 15% uh will bring in some liquidity and will have some increase in uh, trades as well uh, another uh, uh, change that we saw in this budget with regards to capital market which mr doshi had just uh, spoke about was change in section 94 that is bonus stripping so these provisions were earlier applicable only till mutual funds till this fi and from the coming fi with the change uh which is brought in the definition that uh units and securities so when they speak about securities they are now talking about every shares that is traded other than the mutual fund uh so these are few of the important uh, uh sections or app, uh, like sections which were uh, brought in in this uh, budget uh, which was uh applicable or maybe having impact on the uh, capital market so uh, as you all are more expert in this field you all are practicing chartered accountant so like i guess you all will be in a much better position to demonstrate uh, these provisions than uh, i would be able to but i try to like sum up uh, these uh, sections which are applicable to these uh, capital market which was brought in this budget Uh, so that's all from the uh, capital market point of uh, point. Uh, uh, I would like to take an opportunity to introduce our company to uh, uh, the group here. So uh, uh, may, may I? Uh, is it okay to everyone? And now we have already introduced them that uh, it's the upstock, which is the second, I think, second rank in the India at present. The broker. Yes, sir. We are the uh, second broker, and currently we have more than. Convey to all the members, sir. Okay. All right. So, uh, I think Pradeep, uh, you can uh, Bijal or uh, can take the question answers. I think there is one question. Uh, he been asked for I think Badresh Bhai. I think all the questions are already answered by this all. Okay, fine. So I request Pradeep to please uh, uh, give a very well deserved vote of thanks to both the speakers. Well, it is our thank you, Nilesh Bhai. Uh, well, it is our privilege today that we have Sir Badresh Doshi, who has in detail provided us provided us with all the tax amendments that are proposed by the Finance Act. Uh, when looking at the speech earlier we were very not really not sure what sir will be able to complete uh, two hours or two and a half hours that was the scheduled time but after listening to bhadre sir we are having a feeling that he can continue for maybe more than an hour now but due to certain other time constraints and of course the person has a limitation to speak for two hours or two and a half hours i mean on a continuous basis we understand that and we understand that there are many more amendments which are which are yet to be covered so i think we will have to call him once again to cover maybe charitable trust provisions but given the time and given the thing i think he has given apt time to each and every provision which was required to be discussed and what were the new things he has given more time and whatever small amendments he has taken it very 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 beautifully and very very aptly he has taken it us we thank you badresh bhai for giving this wonderful pre presentation um, it is it is our humble surjit sir we we thank you for accepting our short invitation to provide us uh, your brief on impact of capital markets by the budget by the finance act you have uh, taken to taken us through the tax amendments and provided your views on the impact of capital markets thank you thank you very much for being here sir thank, thank you sir thank you so much thank you badresh bhai once again thank you everyone with this we end today's session thank you badresh bhai and surjit ji thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you so much to all good night good night see you badresh bhai very soon see you next year again badresh bhai very soon it will be my pleasure my pleasure
थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू